Hello, hello, and hi, 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 and welcome once again to a Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a show that is a bi-weekly show currently, and we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, anything we feel like, their history, their music, their singles, their albums, the past, and also what's going on today, and sometimes even the future. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts, current co-hosts, of the show for things we said today and this is a very special episode because we're actually marking believe it or not our 400th episode since we started doing the show so in addition to my two regular current co-hosts we brought back two uh co-hosts from the past and we'll introduce them in just a moment first of all let me introduce to you uh alan cozen who you know from being one of the two authors of the McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, anxiously awaiting Volume 2, along with Adrian Sinclair, the other writer. He's also the author of Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop. And for many years, he worked in the New York Times in the classical department. And he's a freelance writer, always writing about the Beatles. Welcome, Alan. Hey, Ken, and Darren, and Al, and Steve. Hello, everyone out there. <laughs> and also we have, of course, Darren DeVivo, who's been a fixture in New York radio for 40 years at New York's WFUV, working there full time on the radio, always given us great programming and occasionally some Beatle programming as well. Always been a great addition to our show. Welcome, Darren. Hello, everyone. Hello, Alan and Steve and Al and Ken and everyone out there in podcast land. And I'm so excited to introduce two other guys to the show. First of all, the man who started the show with me, this was back in 2012. And, um, you know, when it comes to uh, Steve Marinucci, I always like to say probably no one has done more for bringing Beatle news to the world than him. I mean, there's a lot of great sources and of course, Beatle fan being one of them, but mm. uh, when I first started doing this show uh, in 2012, I wanted it to be a news-oriented show, and um, I thought it would be a good idea for Steve to be my co-host. And for the first several years, it was just him and me doing the show every single week, and it was a joy working yeah. with him. And then he also stayed on as we welcomed uh, Al Sussman and Alan Cozen to the show. But anyway, Steve Marinucci, welcome back. Thank you, Ken. I'm, I'm blessing. I'm blessed. 2000 and th would you say 2012? Yep. My gosh, uh, that's a long time ago. Um, yeah. I d did not know it was that long ago, but uh, yeah, we had some we had some fun conversations. Uh, I can I can definitely uh, remember some good ones, but uh, I'm yeah. glad to be back. Thank you. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. Also, of course, is Al Sussman. Uh, Al, for many years, has been a writer for Beatle Fan Magazine since the very beginning of uh, of the, the fanzine. And he's also been a fixture at the Fest for Beatle Fans, where he's been on many panel discussions. And for many years, he, he helped to organize the panel discussions and schedule them. And uh, he was there in the middle run <laughs> of things we said today for several years. And it was a great combination back then me and steve alan allen and uh every now and then we bring him back to this show al welcome back hi ken hi bye guys very nice to be there be, yeah, to be back <laughs> if i can put the words together he's god smacked is what it is <laughs> yes yeah or something yeah but i just thought for a, a couple of minutes i give a brief history of the show because um, prior to things we said today, I was part of uh, another podcast show called Fab Forum, and I decided to leave the show. This was in 2011, and I wanted the, the next podcast show to be something different. And anyone who's followed the shows that I've done on the radio, my radio show, Every Little Thing, the live broadcast especially, and the podcast shows will note that news has always been important to me. I never wanted the Beatles to be treated as strictly a nostalgia act. Because to me, if you think about the Beatles, the group and the solo and all the projects that are ongoing on the group, they're always in the news. 
And so I thought it'd be really interesting to have just a podcast show that's centered mainly on the news of the day. And as Steve will attest, as someone who was bringing it to us virtually every single day on the internet, there was always something to report. Now, I, I must say that um, with all the years, especially in New Jersey, when I was doing my live radio show and I was doing news every single week, my sources then were Beatle Fan, Good Day Sunshine, Instant Karma, <laughs> all these different fanzines. Um, uh, what was the George Harrison one? The, uh, the George Harrison. The Harrison thing. Alliance. The George Harrison Alliance. Yes, the Harrison Alliance. There was one mm -hmm. called Fab, uh, Beatles Monthly Magazine. And it was great to grab all the information that I could from all those sources. But then all of a sudden there was this, this site on the internet, the Abbey Road website. And every single day there was news. And unlike all the other sources, I'd have to wait a month or two months for them to come out. And I would try to stretch the news out from all those different sources. But until Steve came along and I had news every single week, he was you know, my number one source for anything that was going on in the Beatle world. And so it just seemed like a natural thing for me to contact Steve, who was a guest on Fab Forum on one of our shows. And then we started doing the show for several years. And, uh, you know, uh, we said it several times on, on our show, Steve, that it's amazing how people wouldn't think there's a lot going on in the Beatles, but there was so much almost every single week to report on. There really, there really was at that, at that, point in time yeah there was i mean uh um it was it was amazing you know how much stuff we were able to to talk about each way each week um you know we always had something to talk about uh it was it was pretty pretty astounding i mean i can remember times on my you know when doing the website there were there were big moments like uh when I heard about the concert for George uh, ahead of everybody be, before the announcement, that was, that was thrilling. Um, and I remember following uh, when George was ill, following George's illness. That was, that was, um, that was interesting because I mean, you know, and I remember getting a phone call in the middle. I think it was about three o'clock in the morning. A friend of mine from back East called me and said, George passed. And I went, oh my God. And I got up and I had to work that day. That was when I was working. Mm. And I ended I ended up getting up and writing as much as I could. And I ended up going to work that day after getting up so early in the morning. It was, it was uh it was something. But there were, I mean, there were a lot of, you know, there were a lot of things that you that you and I talked about back then that uh, that were, you know, that were interesting that got people that got people uh excited or not excited i don't know but uh yeah it was those were those were uh those were the days as uh, mary hopkins would say well you know fans these days kind of take it for granted because we get our news instantly now on the internet mm -hmm. back when you were doing this you know i don't know anybody else that was cranking out the news on a regular basis like you were so uh you know i think well alan was doing a good job at that point because he was still with the times and he was still doing a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, I think he would uh, to venture to agree with but me. All yeah. Where I mean, you, know, you were you you. I didn't I didn't get to do something like every day, and you constantly had a stream of news. So I only got to do you know if it if it if it if it warranted my editors, uh, you know, I could get it in, but uh, but it wasn't you know it wasn't in. The, everything and with the sort of granular detail that that you were following well thank you yeah thank and you, you know after doing the show that way for several years we started to think you know it might be time to expand the show so we could talk about anything we felt like about the group about the solo stuff and of course mixing that with news as well so we had to try and come up with uh people that we thought we really like to have his co-hosts on the show. And I always in the back of my mind wanted Al because I've known Al for so many years when he was on my radio show in New Jersey on WDHA, he and sometimes Tom Franjone would be together and we'd do a show together and we always sounded great together. So I thought he would be a natural. And we went through so many of the guests that were on our show. We interviewed a lot of people, especially a lot of authors, 
on the mm-hmm. show. And um, and we we decided we thought Alan would be great. I think we had Alan on when Got That Something was released and we interviewed him for that. So uh, so we invited both Al and Alan to be on the show. And um, and Al, you were on for how many years? About three, maybe three and a half years from what, 2014, I think, till uh, I think about mid 2017. OK. And then uh, and then you left and Steve left kind of close in time to mm-hmm. fairly soon after. And uh, Darren was someone that I've always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to have on the show. And I know I've asked him several times before he actually agreed to be on the show. And so it's been a trio ever since. And I think, you know, the different personalities that we all are have made such a big difference in the show. We all bring something special to the show. And um, it's been a joy for me for the last uh, 11 years to be doing this show. And I I would never have guessed we'd be doing it for this long. But uh, before we go on with uh, the news, and I also want to say, of course, we're going to be talking about the major news item now and then about to be released as well as the red and the blue collections um after we do the news um we're going to have a conversation about the the popularity of the beatles today and how do you think that stands and um i think because of the fact that we have five of us here who have been beatle fans for so many decades and we've observed their popularity we can make comparisons and uh you know talk about maybe the changes in our media and how that's affected uh their popularity whether new generations are still discovering the beatles and um so i think that's going to be the main topic of our conversation today but before we go into the news are there any particular episodes that each of you would point out maybe one or two from each of you that really stand out in your memory as we you know as we celebrate 400 shows um why don't we start with Ellen? I, I I think I know what would be number one. <laughs> Peter Jackson, definitely. Yeah, uh, you know that that I think definitely is our greatest hit, right? You know, I mean, it was first it was four hours long. Yeah, uh, and that was and that was Peter. You know, I mean, um, first of all, he he came to us, which was amazing. You know, and and said you know, he was a listener to the show, and that's he wanted to be on it. Uh, you know, you, we we almost all fell over, um, and uh, and then he said, "No problem with time, much time as you want," and uh, but still, you know, as it's getting on past two hours and two and a half hours, I kept thinking, you know, you know we we and every time I thought we should let him go, he would start a new topic. <laughs> So that was an awful lot of fun. And, uh, you know, the the numbers for it, I mean, last time I looked at YouTube, I think it was like 187,000 downloads of that show, um, you know, and he uh, he also had he also gave us that clip of the mal system, you know, taking a, a bit of mono recording from the Let It Be sessions or Get Back sessions and stripping away each instrument and the and the talking and you know what so you could see exactly how that that thing was going to um, so yeah that was my fave and from the from before I was on there when when it was you and Steve um the Chaz Nubi Chaz Nubi episode oh, you know wow. I mean this is a guy you don't see and you have to have a reasonably specialized knowledge in the Beatles to even have heard of him. And you guys found him and got him to talk. And, and he since his, I think he died just, just this past year. Yes, he mm-hmm. So that's something, you know, you don't find, find another Chaz Newby interview out on the internet. So. Very true. Yeah. Um, no doubt about it, <laughs> about Peter Jackson, though. I mean, you know, I, I always remember that he sent us an email because we were asking how long could this interview be? And he said, uh, we, we can go up until Thanksgiving if you want. <laughs> we almost did. <laughs> yeah. Darren, what do you remember if you could pick one or two shows? Uh, you're muted. Guess what number one would be for me? Peter Jackson. Because <laughs> uh-huh. that was just <clears throat> this perfect storm of, 
I still remember. I think Ken emailed us on on a Sunday or something. Like right? Peter Jackson is reaching out to us and wants to be on the show. Now, I'm. I don't even think the filmmaker. I'm not even. I'm looking up to see if there's another Peter Jackson. Maybe played played bass with the. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of who this could be. And then, of course, I go, it's not a, it's not the real Peter, Peter Jackson, as it turned out, it was. And he really did um, just have all this information and kind of came saying, I'm doing this because I'm a Beatles fan. I'm not doing this for Disney. I'm not doing this to promote anything having to do with the show. We don't even have to talk about the documentary. We could talk about the Beatles. It seemed as though he almost wanted to pick our brains about stuff and it didn't have to be centered around get back um but i think almost all of the show of course did um center on get back and he came like ken said he came armed with um um i mean in, in a very primitive way he came to arm with stuff to show us he would pick up his ipad and go look and he would flip it around and he was showing us segments from get back before anyone saw them, because again, this was recorded it Thanksgiving Day, right? It uh, premiered on Thanksgiving Day. So it's about three days, two days before, three mm -hmm. days before Thanksgiving. And he was showing us different camera angles and how it looked from all the angles on the roof. And I was like fascinated with like, all right, well now how did you, how did they end up choosing which angle to use? So all these cameras going sometimes all at once. Um it was it was a, a mind blowing show, and it was nice that we actually struck up a relationship beyond the show. The three of us, uh, uh, four of us, um, and he's to us personally had, you know, it has hinted at some of the things that now are starting to come, starting to make sense now. Projects that he wanted to get involved in, and uh, he's a hardcore fan. And if it was up to him every second of footage that exists of those get back sessions would be out right now. We would see everything, the cameramen dropping the cameras on the floor, um, loading film, everything would be if it was up to him. That's the impression I got, you know, telling us that, listen, they wanted, what was that? He, they wanted eight hours from me. So I handed 10 hours in too late and they couldn't say no. And there's another four ready to go uh, if they would do an extended, you know, petition Disney so mm -hmm. to get them to put out the uh, director's cut because um, there's more. There's at least four or five more hours uh, that need to be seen. Um, and it's hard with the other other shows, I guess, maybe guests is what stands out in my mind. And a recent one that we did was with Denny Sywell. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've, I've said this a bazillion times on the show, how wings uh, were the soundtrack to my youth growing up in the seventies, the sun rose and set with wings first Beatles second. Um, and having Denny Sywell talking with me and having a discussion about Mary had a little lamb and how the other members of wings were not thrilled with, McCartney's decision to turn Mary Had a Little Lamb into a, a rock song. And I told Denny Sywell, I said, well, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble have a Mary Had a Little Lamb that's on their album, their first album, Texas Flood, which I don't think he knew. And I said, it's not only not an original, it's a cover because Buddy Guy did it originally in the late 60s. So McCartney was on to something when Mary Had a Little Lamb. Because Buddy Guy did it already about four years before that. And Denny Sywell didn't know that. And it was like, oh, wow, I, I turned Denny Sywell onto the original Mary Had a Little Lamb, the blues song that Buddy Guy did, uh, which has nothing to do with the Wings song. It was the point that, you know, you know, it's not the first time that that nursery rhyme was turned into a contemporary song. So, and I guess the first one I did with you guys, which was a review of Egypt Station. And that's the only way I'll remember when I started here was mm. September 2018. So it's um, five years. Five years now. 
uh, that I've been doing this. And Egypt Station was the first show. And uh, I still have the notes. I have about 10 pages of notes that I wrote out uh, to have with me uh, for that first show. And I kept them. So. All right. That's, that, that's my book back. OK. Uh, Steve, I'm curious to know what what shows stand out for you. Well, two. Well, first of all, congratulations on the Peter Jackson. And one question. Did he ever did you guys ever ask him why they didn't put out the the original movie? They're going to, I believe they are. He it's it really sounded to me like Peter Jackson. Created Get Back, delivered it to Disney and then was as in the dark as we all were on what was going to happen next. I think I read an interview with Michael Lindsay Hogg recently where he said basically that Peter Jackson has restored it, that version, his version, um, and that it's ready to go whenever they want to do it. Yeah. Well, it was restored before that, remember? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but so. it probably wasn't restored in quite the way that Peter Jackson restores stuff. Probably <laughs> probably not, uh, because the, because he, uh, as I recall, the the earlier restored version it has been on bootleg. So, right. Um, but yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting, but there are two, there are two shows that stick out in my brain. One was the one um, with Elliot. Um, Mintz? Mintz. Yes. Okay. That mm. one, which as I recall, um, I don't remember the circumstances, but, something clicked um and alan you probably I, I know you were in on that one alan um al you might have been too i can't remember uh, it was shortly after i left okay but that one i remember after we got off the phone with elliot um we were all going what just happened <laughs> we were we were just all stunned we couldn't believe it. Uh, it it clicked everything clicked it was just absolutely fantastic and i mean he i I've been I've interviewed him since then, and he he's a great interview. So, um, you know, especially the way he talks about Yoko and everything, uh, that was fantastic. And then the other, and I'm going to smile. I'm going to try and smile a lot because I know Ken's going to go. Yikes! Was the magical mystery tour debate? <laughs> you brought that up on the 300th shows. <laughs> yeah. Yes, did I? I think so. But I I will never forget that, and that was um, that was uh, that was infamous. Uh, that was that was I mean that was fun. That was good. I mean we we both we both you know went back and forth on that one. Um, but uh, I remember that. Uh, well, you know, there'll always be fans out there that look at Magical Mystery Tour the film as being the Beatles' biggest mistake or one of their mistakes, and then you've got other people who feel that over the years it's gained more respect as an independent film and more free form as as a film so it depends it probably, on how you look at it it probably has to a certain extent um but i but uh you know my feelings haven't changed all that much i wouldn't they're probably not as di i remember i was pretty dire against it uh back then but i and i probably mellows a little bit but uh basically i'm not i haven't changed my opinion um too much on that on that one but anyway yeah. i know i did a show on my youtube channel with al and bruce spicer talking about uh magical mystery tour with bruce definitely defending it and acknowledging that it is certainly gained respect over the years from people mm -hmm. like martin scorsese people like that so we all have different opinions. Right. Yeah. I'm, always, I'm always a little disappointed when we all agree on something because I, I, I kind of like when we fight a little bit, you know. I mean, <laughs> you know, we, sometimes we can't help it. I mean, we all like the the last Ringo EP. And, it's, you know, I I, I sort of, um, it, to me, it's it's a little more exciting in a way if if um, if we if we disagree on stuff. Mm -hmm. it doesn't always happen. <laughs> Definitely makes it more interesting. Al, yeah. how about you? Okay, from um, from the the pre the days before I came on board, it would be that magical mystery tour show, <laughs> uh, because I, as a listener, 
uh, I, I, you know, I knew you weren't in the same studio, mm -hmm. but uh, but I, I thought, you know, if if, if you were, that there was going to be a fist fight. That's how that's how passionate the two of you were. I think I've I've heard that from somebody else too, or from from other people too, that they wondered why you know, they said the same thing that if we'd have been together, it probably would. Yeah, you should have sure packaged it as a celebrity death match. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have to go back and see that now. I did not. I, I've never heard of this before. Well, yeah. it was only audio. It wasn't video. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, it was audio. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I haven't listened to it in a while, but I probably should go back and, and listen to it. By the way, one thing one thing I've noticed in on podcasts in general, how many people now upload their stuff to YouTube. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. And and I, as far as I know. We were one of the first to do that um, because uh, I remember uh, somebody uh, did somebody uh, trying. Uh, I'm thinking that somebody from one of the other podcasts asked me about doing that, um, but um, but yeah, I think we were one of the first to do that. So yeah, because I remember Ken brought it up to us uh, at some point. I don't know, 2015, 2016, something like that. And I remember I said this not negotiable. I am not doing. I am not doing a video, a video well, podcast. Hmm. Well, yeah, yeah. I think I think we did have the discussion about a video podcast, but I think putting the audio on on YouTube. Yeah, that's um, what Steve was referring yeah, to. Just but like, I think yeah. the video. I think the video definitely makes a difference. But yeah, I I, I'm really. Go ahead, Alan. I'm glad, and like Al, I, I had to be dragged kicking and screaming <laughs> into doing it. I, you know, Ken was the only one who wanted to do it. Um, but it's yeah. uh, I, I enjoy them now that I have to edit them. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I Are should you, uh, point out do you in, have... the, in the early years, I just want to say, because most of our run, we've been strictly an audio show up until recently. Wow. And in the very beginning... The audio suffered a lot. We didn't have the greatest signal. We were on conference call in the very beginning. Right. And mm -hmm. then we moved on to Skype. <laughs> you yes. know, we had problems with Skype. You know, mm -hmm. so um, eventually, I think once we started doing, our audio signal started getting better. But uh, I'm really glad that in the last year to two years, however long it's been, we moved on to video. But. Yeah, but it, the audio would drive me crazy. There are things that I could not correct, and I had to produce the show every single week and edit the show every single week. And, uh, you know, if you go back to some of those early shows, it suffers a bit because of the audio, but the content is still strong. So, uh, yeah. So, and, and this is getting me to realize maybe I should listen back to that show about I about uh, Magical Mystery <laughs> Tour, because I haven't heard it since we did it. But, but uh, Right. Anyway. Yeah um so along with that and then from the years past years after me yeah uh the, the peter jackson one obviously yeah and but for the uh from the years that i was uh that i was on board uh there's two that uh that stick out uh one is and darren mentioned uh the more recent interview you guys did with denny sywell uh -huh. but i remember what i think was the first one that we did yeah. and it was I, I i think we may have gotten in three questions because he just he just takes the takes the reins and and goes and i think if i recall i think that that episode was somewhere around two hours mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he was probably three quarters of it was Danny himself yeah, he was he was great. I remember that one. He was great. Yeah, he was, he was really good. And the other one, and Ken, maybe or Ken or Steve, you might might remember this uh, detail wise. The day that the the day that Cynthia Lennon passed, hmm. if oh, I remember yes. correctly, we were we were scheduled to to tape a you know just a regular new episode, and I think. I think Ken may have emailed us and asked us if we wanted to do a special, you know, very impromptu right. uh, tribute to Cynthia. Um, yeah. But I don't remember whether, we, and I know we did it. 
and but I don't remember whether we then went ahead and did our you know the regular episode. That point, I don't. I think remember. we did. I think we did do. I think we did do a, a, a another one. A second I episode. That, yeah, I think we did. I think we did yeah. too. Yeah, I know the one with Cynthia was separate for many mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. But um, again, that's also one of the advantages of having a show where you can just call someone up instantly and put it up instantly. Yes. Um, yeah, we certainly thought such a major name in the mm -hmm. people in God's life, we had to do something about that. So, yeah, definitely those. From my perspective, obviously, Peter Jackson. I must also say that uh, a big thanks to Peter Jackson, not just for doing the interview, but a lot of people didn't even know about our show until that interview was done. Mm -hmm. We got a lot of new fans because of Peter Jackson. And um, he, you know, you talk about Denny Sywell, he's very much like that. Once he gets into a conversation, he can just go on and on on a certain topic. And Peter Jackson's the same way. And when that happens, just let him talk, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. because a, a great thing about Danny Sywell is that his memories seem to be pretty sharp for something that happened 50 years ago. Um, Peter Jackson, Danny Sywell, going back to my years with Steve, there was a whole string of weeks when we had one author after another. We had Chuck Gunderson. We had Jim Birkenstad. Um, we had Frida Kelly on. And she was fantastic. Yes, she was. Now that you mention it, yes, she was. She was yeah. great. And of course, Alan and Al. And it just seemed like it was like one book after another. We, we were covering with one author after another. And um, I just felt we were really hit, hitting our stride um, with those authors and those interviews. And um, yeah, definitely Denny Seibel comes to mind. Lawrence Juber comes to mind. Um, Dr. Bob and Laura uh, Kantner. Uh, anything you want to know about the yellow submarine movie they know it all right. <laughs> it's all in their brain they're just absolutely amazing there's so many great interviews elliot mince I'm, I'm glad you brought that up he couldn't have been nicer you didn't feel like there was anything you couldn't ask him um yeah so professional the way that mm -hmm. he that. hunter davies uh, hunter davies was another one mm -hmm. uh journalistically Got to got to ask the question. Given what's coming up in the next couple of weeks, um, what are the chances of getting a uh, a second interview with Peter Jackson? We can always try. We can never guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know? so so you don't have something in your yeah, back. Yeah, we think that like yet. now, between now and the five hundredth show, we should get him as a co-host. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Needless to say, anytime he wants to be on, he doesn't even have to ask. I have a partially written email sitting in my draft uh, folder that uh, asking him to come on. And so, you know, no pressure whenever with now and then without trying to <clears throat> now and then coming out without trying to be too specific on other things because uh, that might be coming beyond now and then so it could be we always wanted it he's always said he'd love to come back um i got him to he was why he was at the he was <clears throat> i'm the reason he was at the fest for beetle fans uh as a guest uh in t uh, 20 whatever year that would have been 2023 uh 22 you know <laughs> and it was just like i just messaged him hey you interested you ever hear They've got this convention and uh, you'd be great. I mean, they'd put you up on the screen in the big room and, oh yeah, sure. Really? I mean, I prepared this whole big spiel and he was like, oh yeah. And I put him in touch with Mark Pedos and, and uh, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. And he was on screen with Michael Lindsay Hogg going yeah. back and forth having a conversation. And here we are, Darren, you and me, uh, Tom Franjoan was on stage and it's like, we ain't saying a word. Let those two talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is not about us. It's about those two. Whatever they want to say to each other, let them talk. And we didn't. I don't think we asked any questions. They just were talking amongst themselves, and they had to be the plug had to be pulled on it because they were go, we were going 
the, well, the fest was going off schedule yeah. timing wise. So, right. Um, mm. yeah. All right. So having him back, so, so, uh, I would think is a good chance that he'd come back. I sure. But hope so. I do wonder like what his, what his, um, um, workload must be at home because unless he's abandoning films in general to work with the Beatles, because you would think that there's more Peter Jackson movies that need to be made, you know, along the lines of the Lord of the Rings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, I can only imagine, you know, I know, I know from our conversation, the amount of work that went in to get back, I can only imagine, you know, his, these long multi-part film series that he's done the amount of work that must have gone into those. And uh, so we'll see. We see. Oh, yeah. And if you're watching, Peter, come back. We want you back. Anytime. Anytime at all. All right. So uh, why don't we get right into the latest Beatle news? And at the, the very beginning, obviously, we're going to talk about now and then and the red and the blue collections. After that, I'm going to ask my guests to share their thoughts on all this news. All right. As I'm sure all of you know, unless you've been living in a cave, the big news broke last Thursday concerning the releases of the new Beatles single Now and Then, and the reissues of the group's collections first released in 1973, 1962 to 1966, and 1967 to 1970, better known as the Red and Blue Collections. The song Now and Then, one of several John Lennon demos that Yoko gave to the Beatles, originally for the Beatles anthology, was the third Lennon song the group worked on, following Free as a Bird and Real Love, the group at that time created a rough mix for Now and Then with producer Jeff Lynn. And at that time, technical limitations prevented the group from continuing with the song as they couldn't separate John's vocals with his piano playing, for which they needed a clear, unclouded mix. And there was also a loud buzz on the tape. And there was the hope that someday they would revisit it with the advanced technology that Peter Jackson introduced for the Beatles Get Back documentary, they were able to demix the film soundtrack and they were able to take, in this case, John's mono demo of the song and separate John's voice. Now, last year, Paul and Ringo set about to complete the song. On the Beatles' own website, it says, besides John's vocal, now and then includes electric and acoustic guitar recorded in 1995 by George, Ringo's new drum part, and bass guitar and piano from Paul and Paul's piano playing is to match John's original playing. Paul added a slide guitar solo inspired by George. He and Ringo also contributed backing vocals to the chorus. In Los Angeles, Paul oversaw a Capitol Studio recording session for the songs Wistful Quintessentially Beatles String Arrangement written by Giles Martin, Paul and Ben Foster. Paul and Giles also added one last wonderfully subtle touch, backing vocals from original recordings of Here, There, and Everywhere, Eleanor Rigby, and Because, woven into the new song using the techniques perfected during the making of the Love Show and album. Uh, the finished track was produced by Paul and Giles and mixed by Spike Stent. Now the single for Now and Then will be available digitally and for streaming this week on Thursday, November the 2nd. And its physical release is the following day. The song will be available as a seven inch vinyl single in black, clear and light blue, also as a 12 inch black vinyl. And an exclusive on the Beatles store, there'll be a cassette single and a blue and white marble seven inch vinyl. In addition, a 12 minute documentary film will debut this Wednesday. November 1st on the Beatles official YouTube channel at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 12.30 Pacific Time, and it tells the story behind the last Beatles song with exclusive footage and commentary from Paul, Ringo, George, Sean Ono Lennon, and Peter Jackson. Incidentally, the promotional campaign is really driving the phrase, the last Beatles song. And you can expect to see that on billboards in major cities with the song title, the Apple logo, and those words, the last Beatles song. And finally, there is a video for the song itself, 
which was produced by Peter Jackson, which is phenomenal. Uh, the actual production credit for Now and Then reads Paul McCartney and Giles Martin, which means it's the first time that Paul will be listed as a producer for a Beatles recording. It also reads additional production from Jeff Lynne. It should also be noted that the flip side for the single will be Love Me Do. The single, as it was first released in the UK with Ringo on drums. This is a nice touch. I certainly think so, because it symbolizes both the Beatles' first and last song as a single on the same record. On the cassette single, the A side has the words now and then written in John's handwriting. The flip side has Love Me Do in Paul's handwriting. Then there's the news about the Red and Blue collections, and they are both coming out November the 10th. These are expanded editions with both collections given bonus songs, not on the original release. All the songs that have been already given stereo and Dolby Atmos remixes from the recent archival albums remain the same remixes. All the other songs that hadn't been remixed will get that treatment called the demixing from Peter Jackson's team and the new remix from Giles Martin and Sam McKell. The bonus material will be handled differently for the vinyl and the CD. All the bonus songs on vinyl will be kept separate on the third disc. On the CD, the bonus songs are presented chronologically. The last song on the three LP Blue Album will be I Want You, She's So Heavy, whereas on the CD, it'll be Now and Then. So the vinyl editions are three discs, and they are able to fit all the material for the CDs on two discs each, which I found surprising because the Blue Album has, you know, a lot of music. It's very lengthy there. The Red, the red Album might certainly could see adding all this extra material and fitting it on two discs um, also for the collector exclusive at the Beatles store there'll be a three lp colored vinyl one for red the other blue there's a four cd slipcase set a 180 gram six lp slipcase set and a six lp slipcase red and blue vinyl set so Right now, what I'm going to do is very quickly read the bonus material for those of you who are curious. On the Red Album, there are actually 12 songs, and they are I Saw Her Standing There, Twist and Shout, This Boy, Roll Over Beethoven, You Really Got a Hold on Me, You Can't Do That, If I Needed Someone, Got to Get You Into My Life, I'm Only Sleeping, Tax Man, Here, There, and Everywhere, and Tomorrow Never Knows. The bonus material on the Blue Album, there are nine tracks altogether. Now and Then, Blackbird, Dear Prudence, Glass Onion. The big shock for me, and I'm very happy about this, Within You, Without You. Hey Bulldog, Oh Darling, I Me Mine, and I Want You, She's So Heavy. All together, you've got 21 bonus tracks that were not on the original uh, Red and Blue albums when they came out in 1973. So... With all this news, I'm curious to find out what you guys have to say about it. Why don't we start with Al? Okay. Um, well, for one thing, now full disclosure, um, I think only a couple of us have actually heard the finished product of Now and Then. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't. Um, so at this point... Um, you know, I, I've, I've only heard the, you know, over the years, I've only heard, obviously, the demo. Mm -hmm. And to me, now and then is not a great John Lennon song. But um, I'm very curious to see what the what the finished product with all of the input, uh, especially all of the the creative input on this on this final version of it uh, will be like. So I'm keeping an open mind there. I'm actually more expectant about the uh, specifically the Red Album because of the fact that uh, using the you know the Mal technology, uh, Peter Jackson has been able to um, uh, well not uh, not Peter Jackson Giles Martin has been able to uh, to s do the separation on those early tracks, especially the ones from the first two albums right. uh, and the singles from that era that were only recorded on two track uh, to be able to separate the instruments and all. And because, you know, the most annoying part of 
uh, at least the stereo versions of the of the first two albums has been, as always, of course, been the, you know, what was pretty much common in the uh, in the sixties with stereo versions of of of, of rock and roll uh, that you'd get the the vocals on one channel and the and the instruments in another channel and nothing in between, hmm. and so now. I, you know, I'm very curious to see how Giles has been able to basically solve that whole problem. So, uh, so the definitely 62, 66. I'm really looking forward to 67 to 70. Most of it, you know, we have already gotten the the newer mixes. Right. Hang on. Um, uh, we've already gotten the the newer mixes on the the archival sets the last couple of years, um, but the Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine songs that are on there, absolutely, you know, it'll be interesting to hear what uh, what he did with Hey Bulldog. Uh, from what I understand, um, the um, the new version of I Am the Walrus. Uh, some people, possibly including a couple of you, <laughs> have, have already heard it. Uh, so I'm, I'm really curious about about that. Um, and and as I said, you know, um, from everything that I'm hearing about now and then, um, I'm I'm. I'm very curious and uh, I'm, I'm probably more curious to see if, if it'll be better than, than my, you know, my opinion of the, you know, the base demo, uh -huh. that, you know. Yeah. Well, you have to picture it as a full band arrangement instead of. Yes, exa exactly. Yeah. But um what did you think of the of the bonus material? I mean, I was actually a bit surprised. One of the things that they did on the Red and the Blue originally was that it was all original. And now you've got a few cover versions in there. The only one that's a head scratcher is uh, You Really Got a Hold on Me, which is a great track. Yeah. But it's kind of like, OK, if this is a, you know, kind of the best of it's that's not really a song that you normally hear as a you're you know cited as a you know as a particularly great beatles track obviously things like twist and shout mm -hmm. and got to get you into my life which uh, took on you know new lives new lives of their own right. subsequent to the releases in 73 and um uh, and especially and also obviously they're um uh they're trying to give frankly to give george harrison much more of a um you know of, of a presence right mm -hmm. you know because they're they're he he really got short shrift on the original the original lineups definitely yeah and you know i i phrase within you without you many times in my podcast mm -hmm. shows it's something that i really recognize as being so absolutely brilliant in so mm -hmm. many regards um but still i'm really surprised considering the fact that overall it's not one of the most popular of Beatles songs and they put that on there. I could have seen the inner light, which was far more, you know, digestible <laughs> as far mm. as Indian track. I'm not cutting down within you without you. I love it to, to sure. death. Uh, but I'm just really surprised within you without you was included in there. <clears throat> I think it's uh, in, especially in 1973, I think a lot of um, fans were still not really ready for that song. You know, they they still kind of looked on his Indian music uh, uh, material as uh, oh, it's it's not it's not good, it's boring, uh, blah, 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 you know, whatever. And uh, obviously, in the decades since then, I think it's um, um, I, I think people, well, people's tastes have grown up. Mm -hmm. And they can appreciate it much more than they could in 1967 or in 1973. Okay. I certainly hope so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Steve, your thoughts on all this news now and then in the red and the blue. Um, 
the, I think the whole lead up to this announcement last week was kind of um, disorganized, I guess, is, is that's the word. Um, um, I mean, everybody kind of knew all along what the song was going to be. And it was kind of uh, weird to, you know, hear them kind of deny it or not to, not say it when everybody knew what it was. Um, uh, one thing, one thing, um, Al, you were talking about the demo. Um, there is, and I suspect they're probably all the same. They all come from the same roots. But there is a, uh, so, uh, somebody actually did a, a version, a, a cooked up version of now and then that's been mm -hmm. that's out there on YouTube. And um it's not bad. Uh, I don't think it's I don't think it's bad at all. I'm curious to see what they've done beyond that to improve now now and then. Um they took the noise out of the because uh, that was the big thing I remember was mm. the noise uh in the original demo. And they've taken the noise out and they've added they actually added a couple of uh uh, Beetle backing vocals vocals in there, and uh, I it, it'll be interesting to see what they've done um, with it. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I I'm I'm kind of curious to see. I mean, I always loved uh, Free as a Bird. I love still to this day absolutely adore Free as a Bird. And every time I watch the the video, I remember that night on the anthology where my eyes were watering. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, it was such a, a great moment to have that back. And it, 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 uh, you know, it, uh, brought John back for not only for us, but for them. Uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, you know, that's something that people don't say very often, but I think that was, you know, one of the reasons why they did that may be the re part of the reason why they're doing this now. So, um, but, um, as far as the bonus tracks on the uh, on the uh, well, one other thing about now and then, one big grumble I'm hearing through my uh, Beatles news and information site on on uh, Facebook is why no CD single, mm -hmm. and I have to and I ask that I have to ask that myself. I think that's really kind of that's a big mistake. Maybe they'll do it, you know, eventually down the road, but. Why no CD single? I can't. I can't understand that myself. I think um, the thinking is that CD singles just don't sell. You know, I mean CDs. You know, at least in the eyes of the of the you know the overall music industry, CDs really have you know have declined so much in sales, and CD singles have you know even more so. Well, th that's true. In a way, but you you have something brand new here, and I mean it's it's not any necessarily any different than Taylor Swift putting out an EP. I mean, you know, um, I mean they could have put out an EP with some of the some of the uh, or even you know you know three or four or maybe four or five tracks that aren't on the albums. You know, they could have done that uh, and made a whole lot more money. But um, I'm I'm curious to see what they've done with the with the new mixes. Um, but um, overall, I mean, oh, we'll see. I, I we'll see. I, I think I'm gonna. I mean, you guys have two of you guys have heard it. Uh, I have not, uh, and I'm anxious to actually. Uh, I'd, you know, I'd love to hear right now if you want to talk about what you thought, what you guys thought of now and then. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I, there's not much to say for okay. example. Right. Well, first of all, just on the subject of the CD single, I think there's so many people who are going to buy this only because they're Beatle fans and they're collectors. And they're likely to buy every version that's out there, all the different seven inch vinyl, <clears throat> CD single, it doesn't seem to matter. Whatever's out there, if it's a collector's item and it's only going to be available for a limited time, there'll be, there'll be people that'll buy it. So I don't really understand why no CD single. But uh, Darren and I have had a chance to listen to now and then. And I can tell you, certainly in terms of sound quality, it sounds absolutely phenomenal. Um, John's voice is so much in the clear. It's right in your face. 
Um, I like the melody a lot of now and then. The one thing that I need to distinguish is kind of like Free as a Bird, where Paul and George added parts to the song and added more to the songwriting. I'm not sure if they added anything to the actual composition. That will be what I'm most curious about um, in comparing that to the demo. Maybe I didn't remember everything about the demo when I when I actually heard the song. But, you know, it's got a great Lennon melody. It's very melancholy. And it's Lennon's voice right there in the clear. And I do like it. I can't say after... I only heard it twice, whether it's better than Free as a Bird or Real Love. But um, evidently, this was really important to Paul to finish this up in particular. Um, and I also want to say one thing on this subject, because when I first heard that this was going to be done, my big concern was, after Paul has said so many times, the Beatles were a democracy. Nothing would go out unless all four of them agreed to it. I had heard that George wasn't happy with the song but i didn't know whether that meant he didn't like the actual song or was it the actual um the sound of the song and and the, the fact that they couldn't do anything technologically to improve it at the time but um if you look at the beatles on website there's kind of like a press release there and olivia harrison talks about that and she said that that george wasn't happy with the sound and uh the limitations uh, th that they had at the time that they couldn't improve on it so evidently he must have liked the song or else then paul and ringo wouldn't have finished it so um you know i'm I'm just i'm happy anytime there's new beetle product out and i think one of the things that i give capital universal apple credit for is that it's very important and we'll talk about this when we talk about the Beatles popularity to constantly keep putting out product. And certainly ever since the Sgt. Pepper box set came out every single year, there's been something that comes out. And even when the let it be box set didn't come out, get back was out. <laughs> so there was always something for Beatles fans every single year. And um, they've certainly made it so that all their focus and attention is on now and then. And I know that they really want this to be, a big hit because they're really driving home like i said the point this is the last beatles song so um and i also think and this is a little departure from this uh, conversation you know we've been hearing about now and then for so long now and we've been waiting for the big announcement and why is there constant delays my opinion i stress opinion i think that it was delayed because of the rolling stones album coming out just out of respect for them wait a couple of weeks after that album comes out, then put out the single and then put out the red and the blue. So, um, but I, I was pleased with what I heard so far. And I'm sure that once Thursday hits <laughs> online, I'm going to be listening over and over and over to now and then, and uh, probably liking it even more. Darren. <clears throat> I'll tell you this about the, about the finished song. Um, it, is on on two listens i i really can't say it's better or worse than free as a bird and real love so I'll, let's just say it pretty much sounds like it's cut from the same cloth the emotions that one feel felt with free as a bird and with real love are probably going to be the emotions you feel when you hear now and then your thoughts about the, the now and then in 10 years i don't know um but uh, all I know is my I teared up a lot listening to it. There was no way not to. Uh, there's something about those three songs and now and then continued what Free as a Bird and Real Love started. There's a certain, um, so you mentioned somber, Ken. Hmm. Uh, also, there's a surreal quality. It's almost otherworldly. And I remember, like like Steve said, that was a Sunday night before Thanksgiving in 1995 at the end of part one of ABC, running part one of the Beatles anthology and ending it with the video of Free as a Bird, hearing Free as a Bird. And it almost I almost felt like this was coming to me from another dimension, mm. you know, um, 
And I sort of felt that same way about now and then. Um, I listened to the demo of now and then a long, long time ago, and I really didn't remember it. And last night, uh, I know on YouTube, there's probably a, a whole bunch of variations of the same thing that are floating around out there about everything. Uh, but the demo that I heard on YouTube, I didn't really hear any distortion or some v obvious tape noise that might have aggravated George because I was more curious about the noise and the condition of the tape uh, and what, because we heard, um, Ken and I heard a little sampling of what Peter Jackson did. And it is almost, it's like, <laughs> It's like watching a David Blaine comedy, uh, a comedy, a David Blaine magic. You don't know. My goodness, this has got to involve. This has got to involve uh, extraterrestrial intelligence to have <laughs> what he did here, because it just this muddy demo of Paul of, of John and John on vocals and piano together. Suddenly. There's no piano to be heard anywhere. And John's sitting right there, you know. Uh, it's 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 amazing. You will not be disappointed. I think, though, what will happen is once the fervor quiets down, then we see what people's opinions of it will be. You know, when you can listen to it in, in a, less of an emotional setting, uh, I think it'll hold up the same way Free as a Bird and Real Love have held up. Some people love it. I worship those songs. I love them. Some people dismiss them. Uh, which I think is unfair uh, and in their own unique way and they sound like the Beatles and now and then sounds like the Beatles even though it was kind of fragmented in how it was built George was there for the early stages of the, uh, of the uh, recording not there for the finishing um, but I think John's got a little bit more presence due to the technology Um probably more of a presence than he had on free as a bird uh, because of the technology of what Peter Jackson was able to do with the demo. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and I agree with Ken. I mean, Ken and I were at an Apple listening session hmm. uh, that was held about three weeks ago. And uh, Jeff Jones was there, the head of Apple who, you know, we had to sign an agreement that, you know, that we wouldn't, reveal anything and jeff jones came straight out and said if any of this gets out and they can figure out who helped to get out you'll never be invited to another apple event again mm -hmm. um so um um uh, it wasn't until hand. like a couple of days beforehand that people on facebook started to leak stuff hmm. but you know and he opened up a lot about it the impression i got about the delay was that it could have been the Rolling Stones. I also heard somebody say it's something to do, and I don't. I'm not. I don't pay attention. I can't with Taylor Swift, but something to do with a Taylor Swift release or something that they may have strategically looked to move uh, the release of now and then. But also, Jeff Jones hinted that McCartney kind of spoke out of turn, or he wished that McCartney wouldn't have brought up the whole AI thing in that. Mm -hmm. In that statement that Paul made, but Paul was being very off the cuff and and very matter of fact about it and referred to AI at a time when we were hearing these things on YouTube where the young Paul McCartney has re-recorded all the songs on Egypt Station. You know, all that stuff was starting to pop up that was kind of scary of what AI was. Now, all of a sudden, Paul is saying, hey, we used AI on this new Beatles song. Uh, and there's no AI whatsoever. At least not in this sense. I was uh, going to. I was going to ask you about that. No, Jeff I, Jones I, came straight out said there is no AI whatsoever on now and then, and then you get got to get into the hair splitting of defining what AI is. Mm -hmm. um, this does not sound like anything was doctored by technology from another planet. Um, and uh, the other thing was also uh, Ringo was talking about it then, which I think they would have preferred Ringo not discuss it. And then there was the whole thing with, uh, uh, what was it, Penn Jillette. Yeah. Going and revealing all of the details, which, as it turns out, were pretty much all factual. 
I don't think Jeff Jones and Apple were too nuts about all of that leaking out. So perhaps there was a delay where they went back to the drawing board to lay out their promotional plan of attack. Uh, and maybe they made some changes. And that was why the, the announcement didn't happen for a while. It went quiet. I even said on this show a couple of weeks ago that I didn't think it was going to happen. I had a feeling they pulled the plug on it because it got so quiet where you didn't hear about red and blue and now and then. And, um, but, uh, and now of course, everybody's everybody's a lot of people are up in arms about the cover. And when I saw the cover, I mean, it did look like it was just something to put up as a visual. It's in an odd sort of way grown on me now that I understand that the artist did the McCartney three cover, which I like, mm. and the McCartney three imagined the cover. And has right now a um, an exhibition at MoMA in New York City, Museum of Modern Art, that's called Now Then. And it has mm. nothing to do with the Beatles song. Maybe mm -hmm. they felt that there was a little bit of subliminal kind of, what do they call it, um, synchronicity or something going on here that the artist has a, you know, Now and Then is the name. Why don't you design the cover of this new Beatles single? It's called Now and Then. Um the back cover's cute, although I haven't really dissected it yet to make heads or tails. They didn't show us that. Um, they did show us the film that's going to be debuted on November 1st. Mm -hmm. uh, again, tears a little bit, emotional, seeing Paul and Ringo again uh, together. And the old footage with George and, you know, stuff that they added in with Lennon and showing... The making of that's what the 12 minute film is and uh and then peter jackson's video at the end um that was both brilliant and very eerie and magical and at the same time it, it made me a little sad because it made me reflect back at all all this time that has passed you'll mm -hmm. see what i mean when you see Peter Jackson's video. I don't know when they're going to be launching the video. I have it probably written down here somewhere. I think it's Friday. I scribbled notes. Mm -hmm. I, I should have scribbled notes like this when I was in college. All right. And then it, I wouldn't have like it wouldn't have been this difficult for me to get out of college. All right. But I was scribbling away during the uh, during the uh, session, the Apple session. Um and then they talked about uh, the Red and Blue albums. And the more I think about the plan, I have some issues with the layout. Uh, you know, I don't I don't understand why. I know it was probably timing why the vinyl is being split the way it is while the CDs are presenting the music in chronological order. Because the whole effect of now and then closing out the CD version of the Blue album is lost because mm -hmm. it comes up at the end of side four on the vinyl and that's when they're in 1968 or something like that why is now and then appearing at that point when there's still like abbey road stuff to cover yet and let it be uh that it might be a bit jarring for the vinyl listener as opposed to the cd listener um and i still wonder if there was a better way to put to you know I was hoping they would do an anthology four of more outtakes and stuff. Uh, and But listen, it is what it is. And I bet you we're going to one day get anthology on Blu-ray. And maybe we're still going to get an anthology four um, album. Somebody else, one other random thing, and then I'll move on. Uh, wondered why Free as a Bird and Real Love were not included on the new Blue album. Uh, and will we'll now and then be brushed aside 20 some odd years from now but he felt it now free as a bird and real love if you're going to expand the red and blue albums need to be on the blue album now um and then i did think to myself you know it's technically not 1967 to 1970 anymore mm. um but all all told like ken knows, says all the time i am thrilled all this is happening and the the rest of it is all splitting hairs. But it's interesting splitting hairs. <laughs> yeah. And there's there's more coming. What what is more, I don't know. 
but Jeff Jones made it clear they've got some ideas for the next two, three, four, five years mm -hmm. on stuff, whatever that might be. Can I ask a question? Yes. Why didn't they do something with the George Harrison track? What do you mean? Which one? What do you mean? Un well, take take an unreleased George Harrison track and do the same thing they did with Now and Then. Because John Why was already they... dead by the time George died, so no, no. But I'm there. There. I mean, we've heard, we've seen some unreleased George tracks out there that have John um, on them. You see, they with with John, George was still alive when John died, so they could get George, Paul, and Ringo all on it. But with George's unreleased stuff, they can't go back and get John now. That, uh, okay, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. that's true. <clears throat> You're right. Okay, just a just an evil thought in my brain. Seeing you know <laughs> going, you know, and doing... as far as uh, uh, "Free as a Bird" and "Real Love" uh, not being on the Red and Blues, uh, that might be because there were remixed versions of them that are on the 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 One Plus package that came out in what twenty fifteen. So that, you know, that may be, you know, a commercial consideration. I kind of think it would have made more sense for them to revamp Jays. And, you know, Anthology 1 has Free as a Bird. Anthology 2 has Real Love. Anthology 3 does not have anything. So they could have put this on Anthology 3, expanded all three anthologies, and that would have made, in a way, more sense because it, it's the home of Free as a Bird and Real Love already. Mm. The third one, you know, which was what they originally intended until they couldn't finish it, you know. Right. Um, so that, that, you know, and, and also, I mean, uh, Red and Blue are supposed to be sort of hits compilations, putting a new track on. I mean, groups do it. I know that, but um, it, in a way, it it it's sort of it doesn't really make an awful lot of sense. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know how I feel about compilations generally. It does. I guess it doesn't have to make sense because <laughs> compilations are. You know, I love the red and the blue. Don't get me wrong. The problem is that you know. If you're not interested in compilations because you're interested in the original sequencings and you don't need to have the non-greatest hits things weeded out because you think that everything they did was the zenith of Western Civ, as I do, then, you know, it hits compilations like beside the point, you know, and not only that, the red and the blue, even as they were, were a pretty hefty percentage of the Beatles output. And now when you add a whole bunch of other stuff, it's sort of like you're you're almost getting the, well, not really almost the entire output, but you're getting an even bigger percentage of their entire output as it is on four CDs or six LPs. You know, if you think about it, they really only made 14 discs, well, 16 if you include past masters, but 14 discs of material. And this is six discs of material. And those 14 discs were really pretty short, um, hardly any more than half an hour or 35 minutes, 37 minutes for Pepper. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, these are fully packed six LPs. So you're getting a lot more than six original Beatles. <clears throat> LPs. So why not just buy the whole collection? You know, why not just yeah. buy the whole collection? I know you. Ken, you haven't uh, expressed the one big thing that you were very disappointed in. You told me that those uh, they did not include the Beatles movie medley on <laughs> on uh, <laughs> on either of the Red and Blue albums. Yeah, I'm not going to buy it now because of that. Uh, yeah, I can't wait for the out. <laughs> but um, 
Now, my general feeling about all this, first of all, I'm always glad whenever there's a new Beatles song of any kind or anything that hasn't been released before. I'm happy about that. I really am surprised that they're that they're doing this for the red and the blue. And I sh I guess I should be surprised that I'm saying that because the red and the blue I've always looked at as being such an important release because we never really had a greatest hits on the Beatles outside of a collection of Beatle oldies in the UK. And every artist out there that's had hits has a greatest hits compilation. And there should have been one. And we all know about the, the, the bootleg one that came out before the red and the blue, which is the reason why the red and the blue happened in the first place. But the red and the blue was they were huge compilations. They were extremely successful. They stayed on the charts for a long time. The Blue Album mm -hmm. hit number one, and it introduced the Beatles' music to a whole new generation, the same way that the Beatles' one did in 2000, the year 2000. So it's really important to have compilations like that because someone who just wants to learn about the Beatles for the first time is not going to necessarily buy every album in chronological order and do it that way. Why not get a sample of their best material? It's debatable whether their singles are their best material because so much of us love the, the album cuts at all. But I'm, I'm glad that they're acknowledging the red and the blue, but I really didn't see this coming. I thought if they were going to do anything with now and then they would put it on the anthology where I believe it belongs. And kind of like what Alan said, put it on volume three, you can remaster all three volumes of the Beatles anthology if you want to. I don't know about remixing, but you can certainly remaster all of them. Gives fans <laughs> more of a reason to buy it because the sound quality will be better. You could put now and then on, on volume three at, at the start, although you have a beginning, that little instrumental from George Martin. Leave that in there too. Um, and it just seems really awkward to put now and then at the end of this of, of the blue album there when you're going from on the cd you're going to have the long and winding road 1970 released 1970 now and then 2023 it doesn't make any sense to me to do it that way or to start um the bonus tracks on the vinyl with now and then and end with i want you she's so heavy it doesn't make any sense don't get me wrong i'm glad the song is coming out I'm glad they're doing all this work and remixing on the tracks on the red and the blue, but, um, and I'm glad that they're acknowledging the red and the blue, but I think it threw everybody off course as soon as we heard about the red and the blue, because most of us thought that they would be doing something for rubber soul mm. or, um, or maybe with now and then they might do something for the Beatles anthology, but, uh, you know, and I'm really kind of thrown off by some of the bonus tracks. And by the way, that's an excellent point that you made, Alan, about there being so much material between the red and the blue. And you're getting, you're probably getting one third of the Beatles catalog, if not more than that, between the two of them. So there may be the reasoning that if you love the red and the blue so much, do you really need to get everything else? It should lead to your buying the entire catalog as far as, as I... I as think I, in a way... I think in a way on the, the Red Album, um, part of what we're getting is kind of proof of concept for Peter Jackson's demixing. I mean, we had a bit of it on Revolver too, mm -hmm. but, you know, for the really early tracks where, you know, people may think, hmm, some of this was two track, how, how are they going to make? you know, good remixes of that. And Giles mm -hmm. Martin himself has said, you know, about Rubber Soul and even Revolver before he got involved with the Mal system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a, I don't know how we can really remix this, you know, because they had done so many uh, preliminary mix downs to save tracks on the four track. What are you going to do? You know, those things can't be picked apart. Well, now they can be picked apart. Um, so, uh yeah, I think I think for the Red Album, it's proof of concept for the old stuff. So basically, they're doing the proof of concept and having us buy it. Um, and for the Blue Album, they don't have to do proof of concept because they've already, you know, most of those tracks are from the archival sets for, you know, Pepper and White Album and Let It Be, and et cetera. So we've already had those tracks. So the big selling point on that is going to be now and then. Mm. And a few remixes from Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine. You know what they also could have done? They could have put out uh, the anthology on Blu-ray and tacked 
the uh, now and then video and the 12 and the 12 minute video as bonus tracks mm -hmm. because yeah. everybody's you know they haven't put out i'm surprised they haven't put that out on blu-ray yet in fact I, I i i had kind of expected that but yeah and uh, there's another thing i do wish that tree is a bird and real love was included why just now and then i yeah. mean and, and why not use the software mal and improve on the sound quality of free as a bird and real love using that technology right why only concentrate on now and then and then disregard the other two so it would have been nice if those three songs were kept together on the blue collection even though i still think they belong on the anthology the Any... thing about the anthology well you know i i, I think they should remaster it and you know put it out on blu-ray and all that stuff I think we we look at that stuff a bit differently now because of the archival boxes. Mm. Um, with anthology, they did all this Frankensteining of different tracks, the different takes, and you know, monkeying about with various things that are now considered a little unkosher mm. um, right. after the archival sets because in the archival sets they generally speaking used you know this if this was take two that's what take two was and if it broke down or it you know had a bad solo whatever it is this is the take where with anthology it wasn't really the take it was kind of the take but they flew in this from another take and they did that and that now mm -hmm. is, is is you know we don't look at that quite the same way when anthology came out we were so thrilled to have the stuff that you know it's great but then once you know pepper came out and we're listening to the pepper outtakes versus what was done on the anthology we sort of look at the anthology as being not quite real yet. right so well, i was i was i was referring to the anthology video yeah the, the, well right oh, yeah. blu-ray yeah yeah, but it, you could also put out an audio Blu-ray too, for that matter. True. Well, they and they they should do it all on Atmos, I suppose. <laughs> I found an article, and I don't want to waste time pulling it up now. So, I would suggest that folks look for it. Um, the website Super Deluxe Edition. Hmm. Is that the mm -hmm. name of it? Super Deluxe I Edition, so. where something in there. I, I don't want. I don't want to say the wrong thing here. Uh, it did not sound to me like there's going to be too many standalone Atmos Blu-rays coming from Apple anymore. Um, look up, um, uh, all of you, when we're done with the program and those of you watching it, Super Deluxe Edition and their article on Now and Then and the Red Blue albums. It was published, I think, yesterday. And it was some reference to the absence of the Atmos mixes and the revolver set. And where are we going from there? And why is it not here with red and blue and now and then? And I'll be I'll be honest with you. If a tracks came back, I'd be thrilled. I mean, I'm still trying to wrap my head around all of all of this Atmos 9.1, 5.3, raised, you know, mm -hmm. seven to the square root of eight height. You know, it still blows my mind a little bit, this stuff. But um you know, this was a, an article, uh, and it did make mention of the absence of at the Atmos mixes on Revolver, and and we will see them there, in the words of Ed Norton. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's actually, I'm oh, trying Ralph to remember. Said that. Weren't the um, wasn't there a, an Atmos uh, Dolby Atmos mix of Revolver that was made available online? Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. Now that's right. That is true. Now on the stream on the streaming sites, you know, I I know streaming is uh is a is a is a curse word to, you know, all of the you know the only physical, um, formats, but you know, I think a lot of decisions that are made these days, uh, do take streaming into account. Of course. Mm -hmm. Obviously. Yeah. So are we done talking about uh, now and then in the red and the blue? We just started. <laughs> We're going to go four hours. 
Just got a couple more news items here that I'll do real fast. As I'm sure everyone knows, Paul McCartney kicked off his 2023 Got Back Tour on October the 18th in Adelaide, Australia. This was his first full concert since the Glastonbury Festival in June last year. Despite being 81 years old, Paul is still giving fans their money's worth with a near three-hour concert. His set list is almost identical to what it was before he resumed the tour. One change in the set list is adding She's a Woman as the fourth song that he and the band plays. The first time he has done the Beatles song since 2004. Surprisingly, nothing from his most recent album, McCartney 3, and still performing Come On To Me and Fa You from Egypt Station and New from the new album. Paul continues to do his tribute songs for John here today and something for George Harrison. Remember that Ken Womack's first of two books on Mal Evans comes out November 14th called Living the Beatles Legend, The Untold Story of Mal Evans. There will be a special book launch event at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland on November the 17th at 7 p.m., which will feature a presentation and a book signing. And Mal's children, Gary and Julie, are expected to be in attendance. Registration is free for the event. And if you are interested, check out our description box for this video because we're going to have the link if you want to uh, sign up for it. All right. A um, couple more things. Lori Kay, who was part of the team that conducted the last interview with John Lennon on December 8th, 1980 at the Dakota, this was for RKO, has just been interviewed for a docuseries that will air on Apple TV on December 6th called John Lennon murder without a trial Lori will be in the first episode which has already been nominated for three critics choice documentary awards and don't forget Lori's new book confessions of a rock and roll name dropper comes out december 8th and we close with the sad news that we learned of the passing of lady judy martin who passed mm. away uh, on sunday at the age of 95 of course the wife of sir george martin and the mother to lucy and giles very successful marriage between uh, between George and Judy. Very sad to hear this news. Um, right. Ken, um, uh, I just wanted to mention that in Paul's uh, Australian sets, um, he did two days in Sydney and the second day he changed a bunch of things. Um, instead of opening with Can't Buy Me Love, he opened with Hard Day's Night. Okay. And uh, and there are a number of other changes too. I, I can't remember exactly what they were, but but there were you know a handful of changes in the set list. So I think he's going to do what he did in like uh, what was it two thousand thirteen or something? You know where where he started having alternate sets, alternate openings. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like that for this tour too. Yeah, for many of his tours of the last two decades, if you go to two shows in a row, he might switch a song here and there. And uh, you'll be lucky if you go to both shows that you'll catch the extra song or two two songs that he throws in there. But uh, yeah, so it, it's not really a, a big surprise to me that he's doing that. Right. And this band knows it, you know, in their sleep, <laughs> these songs at this point. So sure. yeah, yeah. And that's it for Beatle News. Before we continue with our main topic of conversation, got a special message for you right now. I'm Paul Muldoon, a poet who, over the past several years, has had the good fortune to record hours of conversations with one of the world's greatest songwriters, Sir Paul McCartney, reflecting on everything from the Beatles to Wings. The result is our new podcast, McCartney, A Life in Lyrics. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right. Very interesting. Paul's new podcast, A Life in Lyrics. And each show, uh, he talks about a specific song in his career, Beatles or Solo. Check it out. Um, you can actually go to the website pushkin.fm. And they have, let me see, one, two, three, four, five episodes up by now. There's 12 all together in the series. And there is a way you can sign up and actually get to hear all of them all at once. Okay. Okay. 
So, uh, and I think iHeartRadio also has been running uh, the episodes. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, our topic this time is the popularity of the Beatles in 2023. Now, one of the advantages of having a team like us <laughs> is that we've lived through many years of Beatlemania. We've observed it from the 60s, although Darren was a wee child when this was all happening. Darren was born in... I'm not we anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> but we've all seen the success of the Beatles in terms of sales of their records, their films, the tours, the success of the solo careers, especially in the 70s, less or so in the 80s, but still very significant. And um, I really do believe that a big change happened once the Beatles anthology uh, came out in 1995, because there was a lot more focus on the group, I think, more so from that moment on. And there have been so many releases um, that Apple has been a part of. And I mentioned a few moments ago how grateful I am that every year since, say, the Sgt. Pepper box set came out, we have some major release for Beatle fans. But do you think their popularity has just, um, you know, had its peaks and valleys and will continue to be like that? Has it been more of a steady, consistent popularity of the Beatles? Or do you feel that there are times when there wasn't that much interest in the group? And you can also apply the solo music to this. Um, Al, why don't we start with you? Well, actually, you uh, uh, you pretty much... Um... I think did a good job of going through very quickly the the period from the breakup all the way uh -huh. up to up to the present uh, the present time. But um, you know, obviously, there's you know there have been peaks and valleys. But I think it's I think it's it's very impressive that you know that a group that uh, that you know, with these, you know, with the exception of these, you know, electronic reunion songs, uh, other than those, uh, a group that, you know, last recorded together, you know, some 55 years ago, uh, the fact that, uh, that they are still, that they, they still are massively popular. I mean, the, the Beatles channel on Sirius XM is one of its most successful channels. And, and I think part of that is that uh, is, is the multi-generational appeal. You know, this isn't, um, this isn't Elvis, who basically his core audience uh, was, you know, the, the, the people that followed him in the 50s and, and 60s. Um, you know, there's, uh, uh, it's, it's very different uh than than that because he you know he really didn't have any um how do i put it uh any particularly any particular revivals say in his um uh in his popularity even you know even in the aftermath of his death um you know whereas with the beatles succeeding generations it's i think what happened is that a lot of the uh the original fans the the people of my generation um basically have have um with you know our children our grandchildren and all uh that we've they have passed their love of the Beatles on to succeeding generations. I mean, there are, you know, there are people I know that uh, basically, you know, their children basically were hearing Beatles music when they were in the womb. And, um, and, you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't always transfer that way. Uh, you know, there's there, but there's, there seems to be less resistance, you know, like, like for instance, on, the Beatles channel on uh, Wednesday nights, they have a, a two hour uh, talk show called, called the fab forum. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> sounds familiar. Right. Uh, and, um, and 
the first hour of the show generally is phone calls. And almost every week they'll have kids calling in who are, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old talking about, you know, what the Beatles mean to them and, uh, and their favorite, their favorite Beatles songs. And so I think that's kind of, in a way, kind of the secret sauce, you know, and because a lot of, you know, a kid who's nine, eight, nine or 10 years old, you know, wasn't around when, even when one came out. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I think, I think that's, that has a lot to do with their, you know, obviously they're not, you know, if you, if you, if you go strictly by commercial success, obviously they're not as much of a presence on the charts as they, as for instance, they were in the first decade of this, uh, this century when one was the biggest selling album of that, of that decade, but still, there's uh, uh, there's a you know a very very rich following still. Hmm. But how do you gauge popularity these days? It was so much easier when I just looked up the Billboard charts every single week and I could see what albums sold well and what singles sold well. Does it all go by streaming? You know, do you go by that as a statistic? What 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 really is significant that shows the popularity of the group? or their solo music today. Um, you know, I bring this up because, you know, you're always going to hear some people of, of my generation saying, oh, kids don't know anything about the Beatles. That's that's a long time ago. And yet, like you said, you'll hear young people call up the Beatles channel mm -hmm. talking about certain songs. We know from going to see Paul in concert, Ringo in concert, sometimes Beatles tribute bands, there are some young people there in the audience all the time. Oh, yeah. It's with older folks. Sure. So how do you gauge how popular they are today when they're hardly on the charts at all? You know, and I look at the, the Billboard top 200 album charts periodically. Um, there isn't too much rock, <laughs> to tell you the truth. No, right. the album charts these days, And when there is anything, it's usually a greatest hits album. And the Beatles one was on the charts for a very long time. And so usually, like when an archival box set comes out, like Sgt. Pepper or Abbey Road, the White Album, you'll see it debut high, and then it'll drop fairly quickly. But it'll stay sometimes in the bottom of the top 200 or something for a while. But it's not like it was on the charts before. So how, how do you know what's popular and what's not popular now? Well, let me give you an, an example that uh, that Darren brought up before we began uh, recording, and that's that uh, this this Thursday when uh, uh, when now and then debuts WFUV, which is a uh, you know a non commercial station that that plays. Uh, I guess I guess it's considered still a triple A. Yes, Darren. Yeah. Would, station yeah. uh they're going to play uh darren mentioned that they're going to play now and then every hour for how long for the, the entire uh, i assume it's going to be the entire day and the way our schedule is set up live disc jockeys are on the air from 6 a.m till 2 a.m so thursday would be 6 a.m to uh to midnight and uh so that'll be thursday uh, for those of you who happen to see this show on or just before November 2nd. So that'll be the day when everyone's hearing it on a variety of different uh, radio stations, social media outlets. And then we get the physical. <laughs> well, we're supposed to get the physical copies on the third. Those of us who pre-ordered it, maybe they'll arrive by Christmas. Um, <laughs> uh, but in any event, yeah, that was. Uh, why is WFUV doing that? I'll be honest with you, I don't know. Um, but I'm thrilled. Right. I'm not, I'm not questioning it. But the fact that a station like mine, which is so skewed towards new music and music discovery, new artists, and we play some of the heritage artists, um, but our thing is turning people onto new music, that we are taking a new Beatles song uh and giving it this type of exposure 
I think that speaks volumes. And I think, um, yeah, that's it. It speaks volumes that there is still, the Beatles are still heavy hitters, you know, out there. You know, they're age, they're, they're, they're the aging power hitter sitting on the bench that comes in uh, to pinch hit or be the DH, not play every day necessarily. But when they come up to bat, people stop what they're doing to see what they're going to do and if they're going to hit that big game winning home run. Well, you know, I think more than more than the uh, the radio side of it, I think what you, what will be a good measure will be the general media side what what the media will do um we've already seen some you know some uh you know media events and meet and interviews and things like that um it'll be you know how much uh space will uh, regular newscasts and regular shows give to a new Beatles song i think that will give you kind of a, a measure on where things stand now I'm not going to um you know be uh I mean uh, I mean it's it's not like 1964 anymore. Um you know there there's a lot of space they have to compete with. Um you know uh, Taylor Swift is a great example of of uh, a phenomenon now. Um uh, and it's not going to it's not going to be like that. But I think the fact that they're going to get um, they're going to get an, a, a good a bit of attention from the media uh, in addition to the fans. I think that that will give you a good idea of where things stand. And I think, you know, there, the, the Beatles haven't, you know, haven't uh, gone away. Um, you know, it's like, again, like I said, it's not 1964, but they haven't gone away, and and I don't think the media in general uh, will let them go away. Um, they still feel they deserve attention, and that's a good thing. Yeah. To that point, I could tell you that I think it was yesterday. I went to Yahoo's main page, and within five minutes, going back to the main page, there were three different articles on now and then. <laughs> you know. Mm. Right. The very first article listed was about now and then three times, and they were all different. Um, do you recall, Darren, uh, since you've been at FUV for 40 years now, when Free as a Bird and Real Love came out, did they give the songs that kind of respect once every hour? Do you recall? No, we didn't. And I'll be totally honest with you. I have absolutely no recollection of how I handled it or how it was done. I don't remember how the how the um, songs were made available to radio. Well, it had to be a physical disc, uh, and I do not remember honestly how that was handled. I'm I'm actually surprised. I thought about that earlier, hmm. and um, I I don't know how we handled either one. Uh, I don't remember. I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, I remember, but uh, I don't mean to cut you off. I just thought of one thing when the catalog was re-released on September 9th, 2009 WFUV went wall to wall Beatles for the entire day. And we have never done something like that before or since with any artist. Hmm. But with that one day, it was strictly Beatles. Um, so. It's interesting what Steve said, how the media handles it, because I recall when Real Love was released as a single, the BBC refused to play it because they thought that their audience was too young. They didn't care about the Beatles. And Paul wrote a letter to them and he was furious. How do you know what the young people want to hear? <laughs> you know, why wouldn't they be interested in the Beatles record? So, um, yeah. What are your thoughts on this, Alan? Um, okay. At popularity as such, um, doesn't really interest me that much because hey i'm a classical guy <laughs> um and the beatles were part of the classical music department of the new york times so um you know for for me it's um 
you know, just as the sun and the moon are up in the sky, the Beatles are there. It's not 1960 in the sense that we don't have to make a case for the Beatles. They're the Beatles, you know, um, and, you know, through the 60s and 70s, you might have to argue with people older than you or people with different, you know, kinds of tastes or whatever about, well, the Beatles are this is why. You don't have to do that anymore. The Beatles are now, I believe, generally speaking, accepted as part of the background noise, so to speak, of Western Civ and, you know, respected generally. There are, there are always people who don't like them or, you know, will put some tardy post on the Internet about how it's all over. And basically, when someone says something like that, you know, that you don't really have to care about anything that person says ever again, okay? Um, but I think, uh, you know, in terms of looking at the Beatles, it's not so much a, a question of their popularity as such, but how seriously people are looking into what they did. And you have, um, you know, I, I don't want to say that the measure is, you know, books being written about them because that might be a little self-serving but i kind of also want to say that not in terms of my books i'm i'm thinking in terms of for instance um you know a lot of women writing about the beatles now didn't used to happen now you've got you know people like christine feldman barrett and uh you know candy leonard was on the show once with her beatleness book you know looking into a particular aspect of the beatles you know, back when we were growing up, uh, if we were going to get a book about the Beatles, it was going to be a bio and it might be Hunter Davies or Julius Fast or there was, you know, a bunch of little bios coming out. But I remember when the Beatles bookshelf was like this and I now have a whole wall and I, and, and it's hard to keep up with them, you know, more come out than I can, you know, get almost. Um, and that was never the case before. Um, and you also do have in the podcast world, I mean, there's a gazillion podcasts out there um, by all kinds of people. And I was thinking, you know, I was thinking we haven't heard from him lately, but remember Hudson Rainey, you know, he was like, what, 14 or something. And he had a podcast about the Beatles and and he knew the stuff. I mean, we've I think we've all been on his podcast and, you know, talking about the solo albums and, you know, things that. Um, you would think are fairly arcane for a 14 year old or however old he was. And, and yet he knew it, you know, he could have an intelligent conversation about it. Um, and I think that's kind of a measure of something. I don't know if it's popularity as such, but it's a measure of how deeply the Beatles are woven into our culture and how seriously people take them and how much time they want to sit on them you know if interested in reading books about the beatles and various topics of the beatles and you know some arcane aspect of the beatles publishers wouldn't be putting out all those books because they have to justify themselves you know they have to they have to break even or come close or make a profit or whatever it is and uh, so, you know, to me, that's um, that's the measure I look at more than popularity as such, because I take the popularity for granted, you know, mm -hmm. the Beatles. <laughs> what do you want, you know? Um, the other thing is, in terms of um, Zoom technology, um, you know, the... the <laughs> Uh, and the use of backgrounds, you know, Steve keeps disappearing and reappearing, and I can't help thinking of my favorite Martian. <laughs> there I go again. <laughs> anyway, here we go. <laughs> so those are some great points. I mean, yes, uh, the Beatle books are endless. They never stop coming out. And one of the things that I find really remarkable about it all is that authors find these new angles to write about them things that haven't been touched on before or haven't been really brought up enough. And then there's the podcast world, which I thought we'd have a somewhat of a discussion on since we're a part of it too. And um, you know, it's endless. The number of Beatle podcasts that are, that are out there. There's so much that I love about podcasts. And then there are things that bother me about podcasts. You know, the great thing about podcasts is that unlike 
if you worked at a radio station and you had to kowtow to whatever the program director wanted and you can only play certain songs or talk about certain songs or certain parts of, a, of an artist's history, so much is limiting what you can do in the commercial world. Um, and even maybe so in, in the non-commercial world, but in the podcast world, everything's up for grabs. If you want to do a show on the Ringo, the fourth album, who's going to stop you? If you want to do a show on Sgt. Pepper, great. But you can just, you could do something that you could do an album that a lot of, a lot of fans don't even know. You can, you know, zero in on so many facts and, and, and things that hardly ever get discussed. You can make the shows your own. And there's a lot of podcasts out there. And I wish that I had the time to listen to all or most of them because I've heard very complimentary things about certain podcasts that I've only heard, you know, once or twice, like Nothing is Real, uh, for example, uh, Robert Rodriguez's podcast. Um, you know, I'm so busy doing my podcast and my work on the Beatles that I don't have enough time to listen to the others. But what do you guys think about the podcast world uh, when it comes to the Beatles? And in general, is it really um, something that uh, I really think that it's like probably it could be the most promotion that's done on the Beatles is done in the podcast now, more so than I believe it's done on radio. Um, but do you think that it's more beneficial or are there things that you don't like about uh, the podcasts that are out there? I know Al has a lot to say about this, but I want to, I want to get to Steve's opinion first. Sure. Um, It's it's I I I have to be honest. I don't listen to a lot of the other Beatle podcasts, so I, you know I don't I don't know. Um, it depends on it depends obviously on who's on it. Um, you know, um, I mean, yeah, that's 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 really you know where it is. Um, I mean, this one obviously, you know, not because not just because I had. A part, you know, something to do with it, but because you know, I know the uh, standard that that you guys have always had. Um, so, uh, um, you know, um, I've listened to Fab Four Free for All occasionally, uh, not not a lot. Um, I, I I really haven't, you know, sampled a, a bunch of others. Uh, um, I mean, it's it's hard to to uh, to listen to some of the others, given what I the standard that I know, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm familiar with. So, uh, um, I guess that doesn't really answer the question. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, you know, that's and I'm not trying to you know uh, hoist you guys up on your on your you know on the 400th show, even though you know. But just to just to say, uh, you know, that's you know, that's I guess the best thing I can say about it. Well, you got to so, be honest. And if you have high standards, as you do, you'd probably be very critical of a lot of the ones that are out there. I right. Would, as I, I think some of us are. Um, Al, take it away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I I listen to a lot of podcasts of all all kinds, politics, mu contemporary music, baseball, uh, you name it. Uh, and and I've listened to a lot of Beatles podcasts over the years. And to be honest, actually, there are several that in over the last I don't know six months or so I've uh, unfollowed. Because they, you know, they just either either they they just give out bad information, or they uh, they seem to be, you know, stretching stretching a particular subject hmm. out further than it actually deserves. Um, there actually, there's, there's one particular one that I discovered this past, uh, this past summer. Uh, it's, a uh, it's one, it's out of Chicago. It's called the untitled Beatles podcast. Hmm. 
and catchy title. And it's, it's done by a couple of guys, um, uh, TJ Shanoff and Tony Mendoza. And um, in fact, actually, I booked them for the Chicago uh, Fest and they were there. Um, I wasn't because uh, I ended up in the hospital in August. And um, but I understand they did. They did actually very well. And they it's 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 different. They um, they the, the two guys have a I think they both have a, a radio background. And there's kind of a um, kind of a morning show type vibe to uh, to the podcast, and um, and they're you know and they're somewhat irreverent. So people who who feel that you know you can't say anything negative or whatever uh, are not going to like it. But it's uh, but I I found I I I found it to be refreshing, mm-hmm. and they and they're. Um, uh, I guess maybe because of their, you know, radio background, they're they're much more regular. They basically uh, drop their episodes Saturday every Saturday morning. Hmm. You know, almost without. And apparently, they've been doing it for I don't know a couple of years now. So, so that was my kind of my discovery. But uh, I mean, there are you know there are there are good ones out there. Um, you know, and they, te- you know, ones that stand the test of time, like this one, you know, and 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 others that have that have been around, including your your former colleagues mm-hmm. on, uh, you know, the, the the former Fab Forum. Um, so there's certainly uh, there certainly is room in the in the podcast world for that um, for you know for Beatles podcasts. And, whether whether they um, whether they promote the group more than other you know other forms, I'm not I'm not absolutely sure because it you know it depends basically on how many people are uh, watching or listening. Well, many of them build an audience over time, and mm-hmm. uh, you know I, I should also point out that um, even though. I know how radio in general is commercial radio and how they treat the Beatles and how they're locked away as an, an oldies act. And even then there are oldies stations now that don't even play sixties music um, or classic rock for that matter. Um, there are still a lot of Beatles radio programs that are out there that are in syndication. Sure. A lot mm-hmm. of breakfast with the Beatles shows, you know, Ken Dashow, Dennis Mitchell. Um, Harry Hammer in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot of them out there, um, and uh, so I think in that regard, my show, uh, every little thing, you know, it's kind of mm-hmm. healthy in that in, in that uh, in that regard on the weekends that's usually run. So Beatles music is played there, but as far as um, you know, getting into any kind of really deep conversation, which can turn a lot of people on and turn some people off, that's what podcasts are all about, and uh, you know. There are no rules when it comes to podcasts. You can have sure. a podcast show that's 10 minutes long. You could have one that's four hours long if you want to, like the one with Peter Jackson, which we're very <laughs> proud of. <laughs> so, um, and people, some people love that about podcasts and the fact that you can talk about whatever you want to. So there's there's some benefits there, but you know, you're probably not on a commercial station going to have a bunch of co-host talking about now and then at length or the red and the blue collections you know when they come out they might just talk for a minute on the air if you're lucky on a commercial station but that's where you have this is the perfect avenue for that kind of thing exactly you know that's why uh that's why i began listening to podcasts in the first place because because of the way radio is now um the uh, podcasts were a refreshing change and, you know, they were able to, to have, you're able to have long form uh, discussions and, you know, that, that are just never going to happen on, on commercial radio. Right. Um, Alan, how about your thoughts on Beatles podcasts? 
Um, yeah. Um, like Steve, I, I don't really get to listen to a lot of them because I'm writing a book. And the problem is that, you know, you have to listen in real time. You, it's not like reading an article you can read real fast. Hmm. Um, you, ha- you know, um, but I've been on a lot of them because of promoting the book. And um, I've gotten to see, you know, a lot of the people that run them. And, uh, you know, I've been generally impressed with um, an awful lot of uh, the interviews um, that I've done, you know, with with people, with a lot, a lot of podcasts. Um, there are some of the shorter podcasts podcasts when I can because they'll they'll take one topic and do 15 minutes Andrew Dixon in England for Ooh. instance um and there's another British guy Colin Pike um does you know will take a news event and talk about it or do a short interview with someone and uh you know and those have been pretty good um the two legs guys you know i've i've been on their show a few times and i've listened to you know some of the ones that i have been on um and have enjoyed them um and uh you know and your other one um uh, talk. talk more talk um you know often has um you know when i get to hear them they're they're interesting um <clears throat> you know what i've <laughs> Done is you know, I actually would like to hear more podcasts than I can. Um, I download a lot of them, so I've got files and files full of podcasts I haven't had a chance to listen to. Um, Richard Buskin has had several podcasts that I've enjoyed listening to and being on. Um, his current one, I think, is called Buskin with the Beatles, and before that was mm-hmm. uh, the Beatles Naked, uh, swinging through the sixties. He's he's changed the the titles a few times because of uh his his focus i mean swinging through the 60s wasn't going to be just the beatles podcast i mean he had a had an episode about christine keeler um you know so it was it wasn't just the beatles beatles adjacent in a way you mm-hmm. know uh so and buskin with the Be- buskin with the beatles and beatles naked were sort of after swinging through the 60s and he realized it was going to be about the Beatles. And so, you know, he changed it, but, um, and I've been on a lot of fun. He often had, um, in swinging through the sixties, he had Craig Bartok on from, uh, heart, the guitar, you know, guitarist in heart, uh, who, you know, was really pretty devoted to the Beatles pretty enough to know how everything was played, how everything was done and would, quite often pick up a guitar and just, you know, show us, uh, you know, it was an audio only. So, you know, not really showing, showing, but showing orally. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think there are, there are some podcasts that I've, you know, listened to a couple of times. I won't name that. I've thought, well, okay, you know, not much there, but most of them I've, I've found that I have had a chance to listen to. I've found some interesting stuff and I guess it just, fascinates me that like the fact that so many people are writing books about so many different topics within the Beatles story, um, that there are so many podcasts where people are able to find something to focus on and keep it interesting. And we all know how hard that is, you know, I mean, coming up with a topic each time is, you know, not always easy and sometimes mm-hmm. it falls right in your lap. So, you know, it's, it's very changeable, but uh, I think, I think it's a fascinating world, the world of podcasts. And uh, once volume two is done, I'm going to try and listen to a lot of those ones that I've downloaded and, you know, tried to catch up with. So. You'll have, <clears throat> you won't have time. You have to start volume three, Alan. <laughs> that's true will you, will you get out volume two before Lewison? oh definitely um <laughs> yes i'm in i'm in uh um january 1978 now so i've only got uh to go to january 1980 um here's a new problem we've run into though which is that um we've added up we've done a word count of all the chapters we've done so far and we've actually already written close to what we have for volume one and we still have two years to cover. So we're mm-hmm. going to have to go back to each chapter and remove and cut like 
two, three thousand words hmm. out of the space to finish because there is zero possibility that they're going to let us write a long, longer book than this one, which was already a lot longer <laughs> than they did. Can you change? Can you change the years that you want the two to be and three to be? Uh, In other well, words, make volume two so. end at 78, for example. <laughs> I don't think we get away with that, really. I mean, so then you're ending with like London Town and, uh, you know, the first one thing, great thing about the first one is it ended with Band on the Run. I mean, that you, you can't end better than that. You know, he's gone through all of his travails post Beatles and finally has this triumph. I'm not sure London Town really fulfills the same function. Whereas we go all the way to January 80, we have him at least getting out of jail. <laughs> it's not quite the triumph and on the run was, <laughs> but he probably, the thought probably did cross his mind if we ever get out of here. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway well darren um your thoughts about the podcast world of the beatles and i never really i don't think we did ask you about the popularity of the beatles and where it stands in your well, I, I'll, I, you basically have all of you have sort of said what would come out of my mouth I, i'll say this about podcasts i'm fascinated by them but i i don't listen to any of the other beetle podcasts not because i'm not interested or i don't want to hear my other friends and colleagues, I don't want to be influenced mm -hmm. by what I hear others do, whether it be, and I, I know me, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I also don't want to get down on myself. If I feel like I should be doing that or I should be doing that, or we should be doing that, what he's doing. So I don't listen because I don't want to cloud I want this, what well, I contribute to the show, I want it to be me. If it's a, if, if, if it doesn't fall into the definition of what a podcast is, so be it or whatever. I want it to be me and I don't want out any outside um, influences uh, either um, discouraging me or making me do something that I ultimately don't want to do. I've also take, taken a similar approach when it comes to interviewing musicians. I've read other interviews when doing research, but most of the time I try not to listen to other interviews and whatnot because I don't want to end up rehashing somebody else's plan of attack. Hmm. Um, sometimes when doing research with an artist, you have no choice. The easiest bits of information that you can find are others' interviews, whether they be in print or watching a video of a of an interview or listening to the audio. So I don't, I don't really venture into the podcast world. Um, talk more talk. One of the only ones, really, I think that I will from time to time tune in. Um, the other thing is, I forget. I forget everything <laughs> ask my family i don't remember even when half the time when these things that these things are out there you should listen to one of them now now would be a good time darren um mm -hmm. but i think that the presence of all of the podcasts the great ones the unnecessary ones uh because i'm sure there are bad ones that we don't really need to be out there is mm -hmm. testament to the popularity of the band uh i don't know if there was any scientific way that somebody could sit down and take a look at music podcasts only and see how many Taylor Swift podcasts are there, how many Rolling Stones podcasts are there, the Beatles. Uh, measure that with Bob Dylan and, and, and Elvis Presley or Sinatra and see it. And even if there was that sort of research, it would sort of be an unscientific way of gauging popularity. But I think we're answering our question by the fact that there, we just have acknowledged there's a lot. And if there wasn't, you know, if there, they wouldn't be, people wouldn't be putting the time and effort to making these podcasts if there wasn't an audience out there wanting more, wanting more. I've often been fascinated with that wanting more part. When do we hit the information overload uh, wall? Um, 
And then there's also what we haven't mentioned yet is there are the younger generation that have taken on to social media, leading the way TikTok and Instagram. And there's probably several that I don't I've never even heard of Uh, new ones popping up every day, social media. And they are a new slant, uh, a new a new not slant, a new way of being a Beatle fan or young kids today finding the Beatles and and creating all of this content for their generation. It's out there. I I don't know how to find half of it, and I don't know what it is half the time, and it's not meant for me because I don't quite get the importance of the the purpose of, uh, of, say, a 30-second video that's got a million hits. Why? But it's happening. I don't, it's not up to me to know what's going on at 58. I have a, I'm old for that. (laughs) You know, I'm still trying to figure Facebook out. Okay. And um, that's the old, old timers, social media. It seems like. Wait till you hit 71, buddy. (laughs) Yeah. 74 (laughs) here. Um, Skylar Moody is a perfect example. Skylar Moody's out there, and she has created this this Beatle world on social media uh, that doesn't reg- resonate with me at my age or or people who are my age. But the fact that she is doing this and there's people that are following her and are interested in what's going on there, that's all I need to see to, to gauge the popularity. They're not you know, it's it's out there. People want it. Um, radio, radio is it's not dead, but radio as we all know it is it's it's over. It may come back. Who knows? And I don't know if we'll see it, but it's different now. So that's not a, we used to always gauge everything like Ken said with billboard and sales and charts and radio stations. You really can't go by that now. Mm -hmm. So now you look elsewhere and in social media, you have all of these young, the younger generation creating this Beatles world. Why? I don't know, but I'm glad it's happening. And, uh, you know, it's, it's it's my way of gauging that people still care about and give up about the Beatles today in 2023. Hmm. And again, it's not again, it's, un, it's completely unscientific. WFUV playing now and then every hour starting at 10. I just looked it up before I read the I read the rest of the memo um, starting at 10 a.m. Thursday till midnight. Um, why? I'm happy. I'm not asking any questions. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Hmm. I couldn't have said any better there, Darren. Although I, w- I wouldn't say that radio is over. <laughs> no, I don't. I couldn't think of the way to put it. It's funny how I have a very, 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 very vague memory of being. It's probably about this big. Hearing. What looking back and doing research was the first years of WCBS FM in New York City being mm-hmm. in a quote unquote oldie station and playing purely 50s and doo wop stuff. Yeah. And thinking, wow, at that point, this music was just a, was less than 15 years old in some cases. It wasn't even old, really. Um, and now. I mean, it's like it's it's become classical music almost. And it's happened to to us, our generation. Is it dead? No. What is it then? I don't know what how to describe it. <laughs> so wow. life, so life support? No, but I don't know what to make of radio to tell you the truth, because yeah. You know, uh, I've lived and breathed radio my whole life, and 
in many ways, I'm very disappointed with commercial radio in particular. I think it's pretty boring and very it's little awful. Change it's awful. to change it. And but the thing is, now you've got satellite radio, you've got internet radio, you've got a lot of internet radio stations that are probably doing well, and some that are barely surviving, some that are just a mom and pop operation where they don't even care whether they're making money or not. And you've got all these stations that are streaming. You know, I'm listening to one radio station from Long Island and they're taking requests from someone in Australia. <laughs> you know, when you're, yeah. when you're opening up your signal to the whole world, who knows whether or not radio is dying? You may have a growing audience in, in that field. I don't know for sure, but I wouldn't count it out. I think it's a factor just like everything else is a factor. But everything you said is that there's just so much more when it comes to the Beatles than there ever was before. Like I said, the radio shows that I mentioned, um, the podcasts, the books, and mentioning someone like Skylar Moody in the same context that Alan was mentioning female authors, you know, it's the same thing. There's new audiences out there, young and old, and they're either writing about the Beatles or having podcasts on the Beatles, and there's more about them out there than ever before. Yeah. So. You know, I'm not seeing the Beatles in the top 10 on the Billboard album charts. Although we might in a few weeks. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, oh. but even that, you don't have a sense of what is it, what does that even mean? Because two weeks after that, it will be gone. Right. right. You know, so, all right. And I just saw that the Rolling Stone, Hackney Diamonds. Yeah. Uh, debuts at number three. Oh, three. On Billboard. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, whatever that means now. Um. I'm surprised you even I'm surprised well the the record company does, but I'm surprised certain people within the Rolling Stones should I'm should do they even care anymore? What does it mean? Well, I think they care or they wouldn't be promoting it and doing interviews for it. Yeah, because I mean there's been there, you know, the group has done more promotion for this for this album than I can remember them doing, I don't know, in 20, 30 years. I think yeah. it's always a, ba it's a badge when, when a group as firmly established as the Stones and, and the Beatles does really well on the charts at this, you know, at any point at this, you know, at this time. Um, well, things aren't like they used to be. I mean, this isn't, again, I'll, I'll say it again, this is in 1964. I, I was in much in one of my uh, travails, uh, I happened to be in the New York area in 1965, I think it was. So I heard, you know, WABC covering the Beatles' arrival and and doing cousin Brucey doing his, you know, uh, his interview with with them in the Warwick Hotel. Um, I happened to be I happened to be listening to the radio that night, and I remember I was absolutely thrilled. I mean, this isn't. This isn't that time, but the fact that, you know, there are still people, you know, listening to them, getting excited about them, young people. It always excites me when I see young people wearing Beatles shirts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my son has one that he wears a lot and I, that always kind of makes me feel good. And I never, I never push the Beatles on him, but he likes them. And so, um, you know uh, that that whole thing. I, I mean, there is a an undercurrent of young people that that still like them, and that's you know that I shouldn't say still that like them, and that's a good thing to see that that uh, it's it's being passed on. Um, mm. You know how strong it'll be. Don't know. You know, but, but on that that subject of success with their releases, very often I brought up the fact that when it comes to a veteran artist, especially someone like Paul or Bob Dylan with his most recent album. The album debuts high a month later. It's off the charts completely. And I'm talking off the top 200. And so what that means is that the most loyal, hardcore fans go out and buy it. The physical releases, especially the older people want the physical stuff. They still cling on to CDs and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and vinyl, but a month later, it's nowhere to be found. So if, if McCartney two goes as high as oh i'm sorry mccarty three goes as high as number two is that a success to you even if it's off the charts in a month i so, think you can you can point to 
um, the fact that they're re they they're adding or they're putting out the uh, sixty seven to or sixty two to sixty six and sixty seven to seventy albums because like Beatles, remember how Beatles one did, yeah, uh, and one plus. I think that's a lot of the thinking there. I think that's why they didn't do the anthology uh, for that reason. Uh, I don't think be. the anthology. Plus, a lot of the, uh, even a lot of the contemporary artists have the same problem because of the way the charts are formulated now, where, mm -hmm. yeah, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll debut very high and uh, they may stay, stay on the charts a little bit longer than the, you know, the heritage artists. But they still, you know, they, the, the, the whole, the, the, the concept of, of an album being on the charts for, you know, for a long time, you know, a Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, you know, that will never happen in this, in, in the way the charts are formulated now. There's, there's no chance. No, the only ones I see that are on the charts for a long time are Greatest Hits albums. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, even even somebody like Taylor Swift, who is the, you know, let's face it, is the biggest pop star in the world right now. Um, you know, her her albums, again, will debut very high. But they don't stay on the charts as long as um, as one might think. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a fairly short shelf life, if you want to put it that way. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. The charts are about as over as radio is, actually. You know, oh, certainly. thanks a lot, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I need to hear. Radio is dead. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, the only other thing I wanted to say about podcasts, because it's a fascinating world, there's no doubt about it. And the fact that you have this tremendous freedom to do shows on anything that you want to do that you can never get away with on commercial radio. Um, I find that really appealing to me. But the problem that I have sometimes with Beatle podcasts is that sometimes a lot of what is expressed, especially when it concerns the relationships that the Beatles have had with each other, a lot of it to me is based upon opinion mm -hmm. and really is in fact. And the line there is blurred a lot. And if you've got people following you and really looking up to you and admiring you for your knowledge, and you're saying something that's an opinion, and you're not expressing it as an opinion. You know, there are people that start believing what you're saying, and, you know, that's how a lot of misinformation gets spread. Um, I, I've resigned myself to the fact that no matter how much I love the Beatles and have read about them and studied them, I'm never going to know everything there is to know about them. And I'm never going to know about the relationships that they had with each other. I know some. We all know some. But we're never going to know every little detail. True. You know, I always remember, I, I don't know if I brought this up recently, but at one fest for Beatle fans, as I was going into the main ballroom, one fan said to me, you know, George Harrison really hated Paul McCartney. You know that, don't you? And I said, no. How do you know that? Yeah. <laughs> he said, well, it's obvious. He never asked Paul to be on any of his albums, you know, except for all those years ago and all that. But so my thought is that doesn't mean he hates them. Maybe he just mm. doesn't want to work with them. But the things that, that, that fans think about sometimes, they don't take the time to to realize that relationships are complicated and what the Beatles went through. It, it's no matter how much you read, it's, it's a, in, impossible to understand everything the Beatles went through, especially in their years together. So much happened to them in a very short period of time that it's very right. tough to comprehend it all and take it all in. And imagine if you're one of them, you know, and I think sometimes people don't realize that. But anyway, I mean, that's what bothers me about some of the Beatles podcast. There's a lot of really good ones out there, and I hope I get a chance to listen to them because I don't have as much time as I would like to listen. And um, and I love when people do go in depth. But sometimes there's a danger of going too in depth and being too analytical. And where do you draw the line there? And I was thinking about this, especially when Get Back came out, the documentary, because that lends itself to overanalyzing everything. Yes. When you see the Beatles on a day by day basis and you're watching them interact and their body language and you start having thoughts about, 
you know, what does George think about Paul at this moment? Or what does John think about Paul at this moment? You know, it's natural for us to think about that, but we don't know everything and we're never going to know everything. And I'm fine with that. <laughs> as long as we keep learning more and hopefully most of what we do here is accurate, then I'm okay with it. But um, it's an amazing world out there, the podcast world, and it's only growing more and more. But I'm certainly glad that it's it can only increase interest in the Beatles. And um, it's pretty amazing to think that it just keeps growing and growing, this world of the Beatles. Yeah. Uh, everything yeah. is out there, especially in social media. Anyway, so I think that uh, that pretty much puts a wrap on this show. Why don't we just tell everybody what we're all doing at the moment? Steve, you can talk about the fact that you actually have your own news podcast. I do. Uh, it's kind of on hiatus at the moment, but I have a podcast called Beetle News Briefs that uh, is is uh, on audio and video, uh, except the video. The, well, it's on YouTube. It's not video. But uh, it's kind of on hiatus at the moment, but I, I, I hope to bring it back uh, eventually. And uh, somewhere, uh, I do have a, a one little ebook, um, Meet, a, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones, where uh, I talk, uh, I write about my interviews with Davy Jones. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, you can get that at Amazon and Barnes and Noble and you know, any place you can get a, a an ebook. It's only uh it's not available physically. Okay. Um but other than that, I'm I'm just uh you know, taking it easy. My uh seventy second birthday comes up uh in uh, a few weeks and uh what can I say? I I'm still really? here, I'm still kicking. Happy birthday, Steve. Thank yeah. you. Happy birthday. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Al how about you? What's going on with you? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, the brand new issue of Beetle Fan Magazine arrived in my mailbox uh, this afternoon. Okay. Uh, I have a piece in there uh, about, again, taking the you know the the change in times approach. Uh, I've got a piece on the the overall music scene in 1973. You know, we've we've done a lot of this year. We've done a lot of coverage about all of the various releases that came out during the year. And um, the piece that I did is basically giving some context to what else was happening along with the, the Beatles releases. Right. And, um, and then also the um, uh, Bruce Spizer's uh, book on please, please me. And with the Beatles, uh, this was the, uh, the official, um, uh, publication month, although it's re it really has been available since the Chicago Fest. And I've got, again, uh, two chapters in there, one on the um, one on the news events of uh, the period from October of 62 uh, through February of 64. So okay. there's a lot there. And then also a chapter on the, again, the non-Beatles pop music of that time as well. Mm -hmm. and and, we, yeah, Bruce's work has been stellar. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm already at work on the uh, the similar chapters for the next book, which will uh, focus on Hard Day's Night. Okay. Okay. Not a Hard Day's Night and Beatles for Sale in the same book. No, the Bruce's plan, at least for the, the Beatles album series books, um, yeah. is to do one, you know, strictly on a hard day's night. And then the next one, which really would wrap up the series, would be on Beatles for Sale and Help. Okay. All right. Very good. And uh, I've had the pleasure of interviewing you with Bruce. Sure. His books on my channel, which you might want to check out there. And I hope... Mm -hmm. I find some time to read the new book. I'm yeah. starting on Ken Womack's book on Mel Evans. So <laughs> after which that, is, which is fabulous. Yeah. Have you read the whole thing? Well, uh, Ken used me as kind of a uh, sounding board uh, over the course of like the last year. So I basically read the 
read the book, um, I guess, twice over, you know, doing proofreading and fact checking and, and that sort of thing. And was going to, was going to give it another um, uh, run through in August. And then I got sick. So, uh, but, but he just sent me a, um, uh, you know, a PDF of the finished product right. uh, a week or so ago. And it, uh, it, it looks great. And, uh, yeah. and, and it's an excellent read. Yeah. I'm only a hundred pages in, but I'm loving it so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Darren, how about you? What? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> what are you doing? Um, you could, uh, uh, <clears throat> listen to WFUV and listen for me or not. Uh, I'm on, uh, 10 PM till 2 AM Monday through Thursday nights and Saturday afternoons from one to four. WFUV's in New York City, 90.7 FM. We also stream on our website, WFUV.org. And we have an app you can download and listen there. Um, and as I mentioned, if you are able to, depending on the timing of when you watch or hear this show, on November 2nd, on Thursday, WFUV will be playing now and then from the Beatles starting at 10 a.m. once an hour through the day till midnight. So I go on at 10, I'll do the 10 p.m. and the 11, final one, the 11 p.m. airing. Not sure any more than that. Um, all I know is that I was given a memo or sent a memo that said details to come. Mm. Okay. Um, and look for me on Facebook. Uh, I'm always on Facebook doing things. If it's not complaining about the Jets, it's uh, writing about 50th anniversaries and 40th anniversaries and uh, all things now and then in red and blue, and hopefully uh, people enjoy reading those. So uh, Darren DeVivo is one of the Facebook pages. The other is Darren DeVivo, and the name goes oh, trails off, and I don't remember what it is. But you'll you'll find it. Just do a search. Alan, how about you? Um, you know, I'm just writing this book. Um, <laughs> I did stop this weekend to write a piece for Bill King and Al <laughs> about band on the run. Um, so uh, it's, you know, not, it's not an excerpt from the book. It's kind of, uh, you know, rethought a little bit and uh, um, sort of crunched together so I could get as much in it as possible about everything from the writing to the recording to the release and its place in his legacy. So it's 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 always fun doing things for Beatle fan because um, Bill lets me have as, almost as much space as I want. I mean, at least he's never told mm -hmm. me. <laughs> he's unlike most of my editors. He's never <laughs> told me to start cutting, um, <clears throat> but yeah. So that's what I'm up to. And you can get in touch with me through Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You to all of us at um, things we said today radio show at gmail.com. And I guess since we have Steve here, you know, we can, I think we can blame Steve for that kind of huge Germanic name. Yes. <laughs> One word. What's, ger what's the, Germanic? What are you blaming me for? <laughs> the huge Germanic name of our email address. Oh, things we said today. Yes, I, things we said today radio show at gmail.com. Do you know yeah, I don't German remember the. I don't remember the. I, I think things we said today wasn't available at the time. Uh, that's. I think that was why. Sorry. Okay. But I uh, one thing I I forgot to add that I have a Facebook Beatles group called Beatles News and Information, and I'm uh, there. So if anybody wants to get in touch with me, they can get through to me there. You can so. probably get all of us individually through Facebook, and all of us together through. Things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Huh. Mm -hmm. And comment, of course, on the, you know, the, the YouTube channel. Uh, we get lots of comments on those. And it's one of the great, great things about the podcast world since we were, you know, we were talking about that is like a lot of the people who comment on the shows are people who we've sort of gotten to know as commenters on the show, you know, so mm -hmm. we know what they like and, you know, 
sort of what their their opinions generally are, but they sort of weigh in, and it's 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 fun to read and uh, and good to keep up with the people who are listening to this. So, so keep writing. Absolutely. If you want to get in touch with me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. I also have a Facebook page, Ken Michaels. Uh, be sure to check out my other podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. We normally run every two weeks on Monday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern on our YouTube channel. We're going to be doing a show next Monday. Uh, so that will be November the 6th. And then we're, go we're going to be talking about now and then and the news about the Red and the Blue albums and get everybody else's perspectives on those. And uh, my website is KenMichaelsRadio.com. Be sure to check it out every week for Beatles trivia. I do have Jude Sutherland Kessler's most recent book, Shades of Life Part 1, to give away. That's my newest prize. And also uh, a PDF for um, her book, She Loves You, which was the third in her series of so far five books on John Lennon. Okay, that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And don't forget my other YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, with lots of interviews with people in the Beatles world, including everybody here except Steve. I got to get Steve on my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. It's coming soon. Anytime, Ken. Now that, I, now that I put him on the spot. And uh, so, yeah, lots of great interviews on there. There will be more to come. Please subscribe to that one and talk more talk. And if you haven't done so for things we said today, please do so for, for our show. All right. This has been great, guys. I cannot believe it's been 400 shows. Um, I couldn't be more proud of this program and the fact that we've kept it up all these years. It's not easy work. You know, sometimes we did it every week, sometimes every other week. Sometimes we struggled, struggled to come up with an idea for the show. But um, it's not like we just pop up here and wing it. It's a lot of work that gets put into each and every show. And as proud as I am of 400 shows here, I'm more than proud that I did it with the four of you. Um, we couldn't possibly have done this show for all these years without the contributions that all four of you make. The show wouldn't have started if it wasn't for Steve and me. So for, uh, you know, for that, I thank Steve immensely. And uh, this has been an incredible run. Let's try to keep it going. <laughs> well, Ken, Ken, you you're you're being really humble because I mean, you've been the you've been the piece that's been there, you know, since the beginning, and uh, I think that needs to be said too. Oh, so, cool. thank you. You know, uh, I I uh, I mean, uh, it's been it's been incredible, and and you know, you need to take some of the credit for that too. So, thank well, you. And thank you for the invite to to do this, mm -hmm. and thank you for yeah. for bringing this show to everybody. Um, it's it you know when we were talking about the podcast again, I said the standard that that there is, and this one is the goal is the gold standard. So congratulations. Mm. That means a lot coming from you. It definitely does. Um, and of course, we have to thank all of our listeners. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. For those of you who were there in the very beginning when it was Steve and me or the middle years when Al and Alan were on, and Alan is still on. And, uh, you know, in the more current ones, we thank you for being there. And if you're new to this show, check out all the older shows. There's only another 399 to go through. <laughs> I'm going back to find the fight over Magical Mystery Tour. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> Watch. That'll be, that'll be the second most uh, watched. Yeah. Next to Peter Jackson. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> thank you guys so much for being here. Al, Steve, of course, Alan and Darren. And thanks to all of you for listening and watching. And we'll see you all next time. Take care. Bye.